Welcome to my channel people author link will be on description make sure to check it out. Kyoka. Honey. Kyoka Jiro, holding her head in her hands and staring blankly at the paper in front of her through dark onyx eyes, started at the sound of her mother's voice behind her. M mom. What are you, you disappeared off into your trailer between sessions, sweetie. The band kinda got worried about you, but I figured if you were in a funk it would be best I came to see you and left them back in the studio. Her mom Mika looked at her through her glasses with sad eyes. And here you are. Staring at lyrics and not reading a single word. Quote dot 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 quote. Kyoka couldn't deny it. Quote dot dot dot. Yeah. I guess I was huh. What are you thinking about, sweetie? Kyoka sighed, and fiddled with her jack nervously, twirling it around a strand of her purple hair. J just the latest song. Um. I don't really know how to say it, it's not what you want to be singing, is it? How her mom was so in tune with what she was feeling remained a mystery to her, but was welcome. Quote dot dot dot. Yeah. I just. It's sad, mom. Really sad. If you don't like it, we can talk to your manager and, it's not that. It's just, I dunno. Kyoka huffed. It's beautiful. It's really sweet and I get what they're trying to do. That whole, we're apt to sacrifice ourselves line is kinda cool, and I'm sure it'll make a great song. But I just don't think it's me. It's not, what I wanted to do with my music. Her mother looked sad at her, as she took a sip of the coffee she held. You wanted to inspire people. You always told me and your dad that. Why yeah. Kyoka looked at her mom and tried not to wobble emotionally. I just, don't think he would call this inspiring. The world is shit and people wanna listen to me singing sad songs and complain about how bad it is. That's, not what I wanna make people feel with my songs. I get that. Her mom put the coffee cup down and came to wrap her arms around her daughter's shoulders as she sat there, to give her a hug from behind. He would be proud of you. I know that much. Kyoka wished that she could agree. She really did. Kyotoku Jiro had been a great father growing up. He had taken her to gigs and sat her on his shoulders, introduced her to Deep Dope, a band she still claimed would be the only love of her life, and encouraged every bit of her growing love for everything punk rock. Between him and mom, who had taught Kyoka how to play guitar and bass and had sung her to sleep every night, Kyoka had been blessed, but it wasn't just her music they encouraged. They brought her to the hero movies, bought her comics, and let her dream that it could be her saving people someday. Then Incident Zero had happened, All Might and a villain demolishing office blocks in Musutafu as they both perished in combat, and Kyotoku Jiro had been another one of the people who hadn't made it home collateral damage, and a young girl struggling to understand why she would never see her father again. Kyoka had given up all hope of being a hero at that point. Why should she? The heroes hadn't been there to save her dad, and now she couldn't see him again. She couldn't laugh out loud as he broke the drum kit he bought for her at Christmas, she couldn't be embarrassed as he turned up to school on a motorbike screaming along to old metal, she couldn't curl up on a sofa next to him and watch old concert live streams until 4 in the morning. They had failed him, and she had lost him, and she couldn't be like them. The heroes they were left with were nothing. She threw herself into music as her. Escape. A young girl aged 8, and poured her heart into everything she made. At the age of 12, she had sung at a friend's party and had been spotted by an executive for a studio in Tokyo, haunted by her voice and the emotion with which she plucked at the strings of her purple bass, the gift she had inherited in Kyotoku's will that had been meant for a high school graduation present. Her debut single had been Each Goal, a song she had written herself, sung in a voice wavering with insecurity and melancholy. That had been released on her 13th birthday. Not long after, Endeavor and the Hero Commission had torn apart the rulebook on heroes and fractured the country more than it ever had been after All Might, and her song had become an anthem for the discordant society of Japan. Now it was all they wanted from her, the management above her songs of sadness and lost hope, of a world that had suffered and continued to suffer, wallowing in self-pity. They wanted negativity because it was what the country felt, what resonated with people, and they just didn't want to know about the battle cries she wrote, or the songs which screamed from the top of their lungs that better days were to come. She was just Kyoka, the sad voice of our times. All she wanted to do was make people smile with her music. To make her dad proud of what she could do with her music. And yet she didn't feel like she was doing that anymore. Now she was just sat trying not to cry, in a trailer on the outside of the studio that they'd given her as a rec room, 
failing to learn the lines of the latest sad song and wondering where she had gone wrong. I don't think he'd be proud of me. Kyoka said with a sniff, cursing the fact she was on the brink of shedding tears she hadn't shed in years. The world is a mess and I'm just sat in a studio singing sad songs about it. I don't believe in the heroes anymore, not the ones we have, not for what they did, but I can't even believe in myself. She coughed, pulling herself together to stop the tears. I just, I don't want to do any more today. Her mom patted her on the shoulder and stood up. I'll head back to the studio and let them know you need the rest of the day. We can discuss the song with the managers tomorrow if you're not happy, but for now let's get you home, okay? Kyoka could only nod, and she buried her head in her hands as she heard the trailer door click behind her departing mother, slumping in despair. She wanted to save people with music, and she couldn't even save herself. She was barely holding it together as a musician, who was she kidding if she thought she could be a hero too? God damn it. She slid the paper containing the lyrics to the studio's song to one side and pulled another scrap of paper to her, ferociously willing herself not to cry. A song she had been writing, trying to dredge up positivity from the bottom of a well of emotion, but hadn't yet been able to crack. Can't even get you right, huh? It just didn't fit yet. She didn't even have a tune, she just had random snippets of lyrics she wanted to include. Talk of not backing down and standing up for what she believed in, parts of lines that didn't seem to mesh well together, and no idea how she was going to get it out. She wanted it to be big and bold and give people more hope than what they had, but she just couldn't find the spark to finish the lines and give her a song to blast out to the heavens, the song for all time she always wanted to write. She groaned, reached for her phone, and extended one of her jacks to plug herself in. Earphone jack was a blessing of a quirk for a music lover when she didn't have to bother with headphones, and could actually feel the music she was listening to. Deep dope, give me strength. Get me out of my head for a little bit, okay. No. Kyoka's sense of hearing was outstanding, and just as she was about to click play to shuffle through her favorite album, she heard the faintest of whimpers from outside the trailer. Huh. Please, I, keep it down, lady. The other voice was hissed and male. Just give me the bag and I'll leave, I have a daughter, mom. Kyoka asked out loud, her triangular eyes widening. What the hell was happening to her mom? And she won't have a mom if you keep this shit up. Give me the damn bag, oh hell no. Kyoka clutched the phone that was still plugged into her jack. This guy was trying to rob her mom. Please, I, don't make me use the knife, stupid. Last chance, give me the bag, no. Kyoka had no idea how she moved so fast. One second she was slumped at the table in her little rec room, head in her hands and no motivation at all, and the next second she had charged the door of the trailer, kicking it open and storming outside. As the door slammed back on its hinge and threatened to hit, she took in the scene, one mom, a terrified look on her face, and one punk in a raggedy hoodie, pointing a dirty knife at her mom, stunned at the sight of an angry teenager practically vibrating as he glared at him. The hell are you doing to her? The idiot in the hoodie snarled. Oh there's two of you. Great. Now you get to watch. Hurrah, heartbeat. Kyoka's quirk did strange things which had taken her completely by surprise. For a long time she thought, like her mother did, that all she could do was listen. To her great surprise one day when she plugged herself into her dad's largest subwoofer for a dare, she could use her jacks to blast vibrations out, in some kind of strange sonic wave. Now, with her phone in hand, Kyoka had a weapon too in its speakers, and a heartbeat she could use to blast out as a wave. With all the anger she was feeling, the pulse of sound from the phone's speaker came out with such force that it sent the low life flying, knife flying out of his grasp. Herc. Kyoka didn't even wait for the guy to hit the ground, slumped unconscious, before she ran over to her mother and dragged her into the trailer. Mom. Are you, Kyoka? Her mom looked stunned. What did you do, you're alright? Quote dot dot dot. Yeah. Mika took a deep breath. You just, saved me. I wasn't gonna let him hurt you mom. Kyoka took a moment to steady herself, before leaning back against the door and letting out a whistle. Holy crap. I used my quirk on him didn't I? Quote dot dot dot. Yeah. Her mom rubbed her arm. You did good, Kyoka. I was worried before you turned up. Thank you. Quote dot dot dot. Hey. Nobody messes with us. Kyoka paused. That, felt good. Maybe, but I don't think you can do something like that again, Mika said, looking concerned. 
What if someone in the police finds out you used your quirk illegally? You know what they're like about unlicensed quirk use, and then the studio would be on our backs too. That truth hit Kyoka as she came down from the adrenaline high. Her mother was right, unfortunately the new rules made by Endeavor and the commission saw to it that anyone using their quirk in public without a license would be punished. Their patience for people taking the law into their own hands was shorter than UA's principal, and with her profile as a singer, they wouldn't drop a case against her if they found her. Ever irrational thought in her head said to her that maybe her mom was right to be concerned, maybe it was for the best to sweep that incident under the rug and pretend it never happened, and go back to making music in the hope that someone would take the message to heart. But, you know what, maybe I can. Dot dot dot. Why did she have to draw the line just at saving? Her mother. Why couldn't she do more? Well, maybe I should, anyway. Kyoka. No, mom, I. Why did she have to stop with just one person? Why was what she did something that the rest of society would frown on? Why couldn't she do more? I can do so much more. I can, save other people. You. Her mom stared at her, curious. You want to train. Become a pro hero. I think you've missed the intake for Rua and Shikitsu this year, but you can apply next year. I'm sure even as a celebrity you'd be welcome, no, mom. I wanna save people. Kyoka clenched a fist, aware how skinny how her fingers were, and how much work she would have to do to get herself into shape. I always wanted to do it. Since dad died, I wanted to do it with my music. But, I can do so much more. I want to be a hero. I don't have to be a pro to do that. I don't want to wait and jump through hoops when I could start right now. Onyx's eyes met those of her mother, and Kyoka made up her mind, taking the leap. I can do it my way, one person at a time, on my own terms. Screw waiting for Rua to tell me when I can start a three-year path to learn how to help people. I can do it myself. Light dawned on her mother's face. Are you suggesting, to be a vigilante? Kyoka smirked. Hell yeah. It's against the law, yep. The pro heroes would come down on you so hard if they caught you, yep. And you could get hurt, I could. Kyoka cracked her knuckles. But I wanna do it, mom. For all those people in the dark places that get forgotten. Those people who listen to my music and think there's no hope. I wanna give that to them. Kyoka. Her mom looked at her. That's, insane. Yeah, I know. It's crazy and it's stupid and I could get hurt or arrested or killed or all sorts of weird shit could happen. It's, totally punk rock. Whatever answer she was expecting from her mom, that wasn't it. Huh. You really wanna do that around being a musician. To do it the dangerous way and still sing your songs. Mika shook her head with a chuckle. You're our daughter, alright. You're not mad. Kyoka, dear, I couldn't change your mind if I wanted to. But, I don't want to. Her mom smiled faintly. You've always been a rebel, because that's how we raised you, but you've got such a big heart. If you wanna use that to help people and give them hope, by doing more than watching the world get darker, then I'm proud of you. Mom, just promise me you'll get a disguise, for crying out loud. I know the jacks are hard to hide but you're kind of a celebrity singer, Kyoka. We can't have you exposed the second you take on your first bad guy. I promise. That's my girl, you just aren't happy to sit by anymore, are you? Not when I could do something, right now. Then you're gonna do great, Kyoka. Her mom shook her head. If you're half as good saving people as you are writing songs, then you're going to go platinum as a vigilante. I can do it around my music, and I can make a difference, she said, clenching a fist. If I save even just one person, then I'll be proud. And I hope somewhere dad can be too. He will be as proud as me. He always said you would make a great musician, her mom said, holding out a hand to squeeze her arm. But he said you'd make a great hero too. Hero too. Kyoka's eyes went wide, and she felt something she hadn't felt in a long time. The feeling of watching All Might wind up to land a final blow on TV, the feeling she got when the deep dope drummer lift his drumsticks high before bringing them crashing down to start a song. The feeling the very first time she sang on stage at a school performance, two beaming parents in the front row in a better time. Lightning. Mom. W what? Her mom. Watched, startled, as Kyoka scrambled for her piece of paper and scribbled something in shocking handwriting, before reaching for an acoustic guitar she kept by the table in the room. What are you, she was silenced as Kyoka's fingers danced across the strings as if in a trance, and finally, finally, 
after so long where they just wouldn't stick the words came, fitting a tune she had plucked from thin air. Hero 2, I am a hero too, my heart is set, and I won't back down. Kyoko looked up at her mom and felt her shoulders lift higher, as if a great weight had finally been lifted from them. Quote dot dot dot, I found it, you found it, the song, the song to beat all songs. Her mom smiled, and Kyoka knew she understood. The song you promised your dad. Dad's song. Kyoka met her mom's eyes with her own and smiled herself, in a way she hadn't in a long time. I'll be a proper hero for him, I'll save people for him, and I'll sing this song for him to celebrate it all. That sparkle in your eyes. Her mom's eyes glistened with pride. I've not seen that in a long time. That's my girl. You're really gonna support me on this. Hell yeah I am. I've been dreaming of making my daughter a kick-ass costume since she was a little girl. Mika adjusted her classes and smirked just like a daughter. But we'll sort that later, earphone jack. You've got a song to write. Pass me that paper and I'll do lyrics for you as you go, okay. Got it. As she chucked the pen across to her mother, Kyoka's hand settled back on the guitar and strummed at it like it was second nature, a single C minor chord that seemed to reverberate up through her arms and in her heart. She drank in the sound of the guitar and savored the moment, the adrenaline kick from what she was planning to do, the taste of victory as she finally found the song she had been looking for her whole life. What she was planning was dangerous, reckless, impulsive, and terribly thought out. There were risks at every corner, and potential enemies to be made with any action she took simply because their politics didn't stand for her doing it. But she had never felt more alive than she did the moment she decided to act, to be the type of hero she missed seeing rather than let it all pass her by. She was going to save people, and she was going to use her music to make people smile. She could do both. She would do both. And she would kick ass doing both. Song first, kick ass as a vigilante later. Hero 2, strength doesn't make a hero, asterisk asterisk asterisk. To ya. Dobby looked up from picking at an itching piece of burnt skin to look at his brother, hunched over on a crate and buried in a hoodie three sizes too big for him. Show. Can you trust these guys? Dobby paused. Quote dot dot dot. You're scared, huh? It's just been us up until now. Shoto looked up at him, mismatched eyes meeting his blue ones, his face betraying his nerves. And Endeavor, I know. Dobby sighed. Trust me, I know. These aren't the sort of people who would turn you in for the bounty on your head, I promise. You don't think. I don't think it at all. They're not like those guys in Kyushu. That made them a rarity, as far as he was concerned. Everyone else just had it out for them. Since Shoto Todoroki had fallen into his life, angry at the world and wanting to rebel against Endeavor for becoming an undeserving number one hero, Dobby's life had become a complicated mess. He had slipped under the radar and into the underworld when Endeavor had cast him aside, and it had been easy for the world to forget his past name. The lowest of the low welcomed him among their ranks with open arms, and nobody batted an eyelid. Shoto had been completely different. Father's perfect progeny, the boy he wanted to surpass him, had upped and left the second that Endeavor announced that he wanted to change the world. Word had gotten round that a boy destined to be stronger than Endeavor had rejected him, undermining that message, and so bounties were put on Shoto's head. Now the police and heroes were out looking for him, and the bloodhounds in the shadows saw the chance at glory and money, taking on work for the number one to bring down his son. All of them were hunting. Dobby and Shoto had spent a few weeks on the run at this point, and the one time that Dobby tried to cash some favors, he had learned the hard way how strong an incentive Shoto provided. Friends of his in the back alleys of Kyushu, who had supported his raids on drug dealers and small-time gangs to clean them out of areas the police wouldn't touch, turned on him in an instant. If it weren't for Shoto's insane quirk, they might have got the jump on both of them. As it was, it took a bus-sized iceberg to buy them enough time to escape, and curse their bad luck. He went back and hunted them down later that night, when Shoto had finally succumbed to sleep and got over the adrenaline rush. He didn't even care that they made bad fuel. Nobody tried to hurt his brother. He stretched his arms out, and focused back on Shoto. It's not like that. Those guys did a lot of dirty work like me. The two we want to speak to are at the top of their game. Trust me. You haven't even told me who they are, Shoto said, and if Dobby didn't know better he detected a touch of a sulk in his brother's tone. I'll trust them more when I see who we're dealing with. Dobby looked around the abandoned warehouse they had ended up calling their impromptu base in Hosu. 
Some long time ago this was a distribution center for a clothing giant, but now it was just a mausoleum to bad fashion, no other person around for miles. That suited Dobby perfectly, Ingenium was active in Hosu, and was one of the good heroes left. It was best they kept under the radar. The best in the business. Perfect for what we need to do. Shoto looked up now. Do you still think this is the best plan? For now, absolutely. Dobby nodded to his younger brother. You want to get back at our old man, right? The mismatched eyes flashed with rage for just a second. More than anything. Dobby smirked. Good. Then trust me when I say this we can't go after him personally. We do more damage going after those who hold him up, and bring him down a piece at a time. And for that, we need help. We can't do it alone. Shoto seemed to stare right through him. How do you do it? Do what? He. The monotone voice cracked for a second. He rejected you. He hurt you and cast you out because you weren't perfect for his little project. He hurts so many more people besides us. How? How do you not hate him with everything you have? I do. Blue flames flickered in his palm for a second as his composure faltered. I hate the bastard. I hate what he did to me, and to you, and what he does to so many people. But. We have to do better than him. We have to beat him. Dobby could understand the kid's fury more than anything. He had lived it, after all, at rock bottom when he was first struggling to scrounge enough food together from the leftovers chucked into dumpsters, when he didn't have a roof over his head. At his lowest, when the rain poured down his back through the collar of his coat and the burn marks on his skin screamed out in pain, he wanted nothing more than to watch his father turn to ash before his eyes. Sometimes that rage and desire to make Endeavor pay was all that had got him through. But when he properly opened his eyes, and saw what the world had become after All Might had died, he saw what patience he needed to have to deal with his. Dear old dad. Endeavor had stepped into an All Might-sized vacuum to stem the tide of villainy across Japan, and had divided society by doing so to the point that there were already murmurs of those turning against him. To confront him head-on when the nation was angriest would have been suicide, their chances were better the more they chipped away at his support, until it was Endeavor standing alone against his sons, and until Hero Society could rise up to put someone worthy in his place to be the symbol they needed. Then they could snuff out his flames for good. We don't want him to go down. We want him to be put down so he doesn't get back up. Dobby looked Shoto up and down, oversized hood hanging over one side of his face now as if to obscure the scar over his eye. You're strong, but he's been training you, right? Yeah, then we need to be stronger. To the point he won't know what's coming from you. So we train, and we work. Dobby looked up at the roof. We take away the bastard's support networks. We target his sponsors, his sidekicks, his agency, anyone associated we can get our hands on. The more they turn their backs on him, the better chance we have of keeping him down. These guys can help with that. They're probably better at what I'm planning than I am more experienced, for sure. I see now, Shoto responded, looking thoughtful. I, had my concerns. I know you did. Dobby reached over with a scarred hand to ruffle his younger brother's hair, and suppressed a laugh as Shoto flinched. You wanted to be a proper hero before, and go to Ua, right? Why yeah, and now here we are, planning to rob people to prove a point. Not exactly heroic. I see why some people think that vigilantes are villains, now, Shoto replied, coldly. Hey, me too. But we beat him this way. We take money from the rich and the corrupt, the ones who he helped profit off the back of his rise, and we destroy their faith in his ability to protect them. I, Shoto sagged. I know. It's, difficult to understand that from my view. But I understand why you want to do it, and I'm with you. Dobby nodded to him. Good kid. You won't be as involved as me or the others. If everything goes south, we'll take the fall so you can go free. To ya you have a better chance than me of still making it. Of being the hero he should be. I'll make sure of it. Do. Do your friends think the same as you? Hmm. You said they were people who you've stolen with before. Did they do it for the same reasons? Are they greedy, or is there more of a goal to their work? Oh yeah. They're like you and me. Dobby nodded. They see the fake heroes out there too. They strike out against the greedy, and the corrupt. Turns out we all wanted the same thing a world where people just did the right thing. I see. You'll recognize them I'm sure. The Hero Commission put big bounties on them just like the one Endeavor put on ours. They hate vigilantes after all, and people who steal from them. They're famous. Infamous. 
always chasing the spotlight. Quite so, but what is the fun of shying away from the spotlight, Dobby? Dobby smirked at the way in which Shoto jumped up and iced his entire left side in preparation for a fight. He was used to the tricks they deployed by now. Easy, Juhio. He's with us. The masked man before them was in a funny outfit, and Dobby wasn't surprised at his brother's reaction. A long orange coat covered up what looked like smart clothes, and there was no chance of catching any distinguishing features whatsoever, between the massive brown top hat atop his head and the white and black mask with its intricate patterning on his face, the man was completely covered. How he had snuck up on them completely unnoticed was a credit to his skill, and half of the reason Dobby had reached out to him so quickly. For an attention seeker in such bizarre clothing, he could sneak around with the best of them. The man looked Shoto up and down, and gave a little bow, his orange coat flapping slightly as a breeze blew through the old warehouse. Well, well, the prodigal son of Endeavor, here before me. I assure you, young man, I mean you and your guardian no harm. If he meant harm, you wouldn't have known a thing about it, Dobby said, leaning back against a pillar. Stick to the code names though, compress. Or tired of the unwanted attention. Ha. Well said. The masked man clapped his hands, before extending one out to Shoto. Atsuhiro Seiko, at your service. I gather from Dobby that you go by Juhio these days, so if you please when we're in the field, I am Mr. Compress. Compress. Shoto paused for thought and then shook the offered hand. I think Endeavor talked about you before. Aren't you the magician thief, the one who broke into the commission itself? Bravo. The older man bounced a little bit, and although the mask gave nothing away, Dobby could tell when his old acquaintance was smiling. I must say, you did well to find out Dobby is a guardian and convince him to take you on. He's notoriously hard to please. Dobby could take that coming from Compress. He had earned it. In his time working in the shadows, he had met very few people he could trust, and very few he had the patience to work with more than once. Compress was a thief rather than a vigilante, but a damn good one, and one with principles, he had been someone who he partnered with to rob an agency affiliated to Endeavor, in order to expose some of the sidekicks for taking bribes from local officials. As much as the man's constant flair for dramatics had probably caused more chaos than necessary, he was competent, reliable for his ability to escape from tight situations, and ultimately willing to share in Dobby's goal of striking at those in high places, if only to indulge his own desire to seek attention with high-profile work. When Shoto came to him, and as he started the first plans to strike out at Endeavor, Dobby knew he could rely on Compress to get involved. Anything for a moment of glory. The kid wants the same as me, Compress, Dobby replied. Anything to get at the corrupt, and anything to get at Endeavor. Ah, a kindred spirit. Compress clutched a fist to his chest as if emotional. A Robin Hood, a daring rogue, itching to strike a blow to the mighty and corrupt and bring down those who make a mockery of us all. Quote dot dot dot. Something like that, Shoto replied uneasily. May I ask you something? Of course. Fire away, young apprentice. I, I came with Dobby because I want to get back at Endeavor. I want him to pay. Do, you think this is the right way to do it? Why shouldn't I fight him now? Dobby hadn't been expecting that question, but nor did he expect Compress to take it in such good stride, sliding across to put an arm on his brother's shoulder. I understand. You crave the ability to take him on, to make a final stand and expose him immediately. That's good that desire will carry you far, and it's a good drive for you to perform well. But Dobby is right, of course, with the experience of a life in the shadows working towards that goal. Strike at him now and people will be there to pick him back up. Strike at him when you've isolated him, and you can achieve what you want. You think so? Absolutely. It's like a game of chess, Compress said, with a flourish. It wouldn't do to rush the king when all of his supporting army is intact. Knock out the key pieces and force him into a corner so he submits to checkmate. That's your game plan, isn't it? Dobby. That's right. Dobby looked around behind Compress. Weren't you supposed to arrive together? The older man sighed loudly, exuberantly. He got distracted along the way. A mugger in an alleyway required his attention. That's, to be expected with him. Compress fiddled with his mask. If I know anything of my friend though, he's curious to hear your plans, or he wouldn't have agreed to meet so easily. He's a busy man these days. Clearly, Dobby said with a smirk. 
he's got his hands full with the muggers of this city, for a start. All in a fine day's work for vigilantes such as ourselves. We do the work the heroes fail to do, for the good of all. Wouldn't you agree, Compress? Shoto's lack of awareness for his surroundings made him leap out of his skin at the sudden booming voice above him. That voice. That's, Dobby couldn't help but feel a little bit impressed as he looked up. He had accepted the invite after all. Now they had a fierce little group if only he could convince him to stay. I'm glad you came. I'm small fry in the vigilante scene compared to you. Nonsense. You're rather notorious in our world, Dobby. The newcomer leapt down from the rafters and landed before the trio in a flourish, black coat billowing behind him. When I heard from Compress that you wanted to team up for a job, I found myself rather intrigued. The Blue Flame himself, an unbeaten vigilante, wants my help. This must be good. We could use all the help we can get. We're going after a big target. I gathered. Endeavor, correct. The newcomer, tall and lanky and dressed in fine tailored clothes, bunched a gloved fist. He and the commission have spent long enough trying to put me behind bars for trying to help those less fortunate. I think it's high time someone took a stand and struck a blow against him in return. Good to see you, old friend, Compress said warmly, tipping his hat to the gray-haired man opposite him. I'm glad you came along. Any excuse to work with you again, you old rogue. The man returned a friendly nod to Compress with twinkling blue eyes, and then smiled warmly at Shoto, mustache curling upwards. And you would be the young Todoroki. A pleasure to meet you. The name is Danjiro Tobita, but the rest of the world knows a different name. You may call me. Gentle. You're really him. Shoto seemed in awe. You're the gentleman thief who's never been caught. The elastic hero of the night. The most famous vigilante in western Japan. Gentle criminal, just gentle, my boy. The commission added the criminal when they wanted to stop me being a better hero than their own. Gentle winked at him. You sound like a fan. May I assume that you watch my videos? Every single one. Shoto had the closest thing to a smile on his scarred face. Quote dot dot dot. Thank you for coming. If you're helping us then we might just succeed. My dear boy, it is my pleasure to assist, Gentle said soothingly. When I heard the rumors about how Endeavor treated you, I found myself appalled. When I heard that you had run away and become one of us, one of the vigilantes trying to do the hero's jobs, I couldn't have been prouder. If we can be of assistance in bringing that vile man down, we will do what we can. We. Dobby frowned. You and Compress, or, Gentle shook his head. I brought one more, actually, if you don't mind. A sidekick. Dobby raised an eyebrow as a short woman with two gigantic red pigtails walked through from behind him to stand by Gentle's side. He really did need to work on spotting people sneaking around. I always thought you were a solo act, Gentle. I could say the same about you, until you picked the young Todoroki up as a companion, Gentle said in an amused tone. Manami has been with me for a couple of years now, behind the scenes. You didn't think I filmed all those videos myself, did you? Call me La Brava when we're working, she chided Gentle, despite being nearly half his height, before turning to Dobby and Shoto. If you're calling in my Gentle for a job, then you must have something big planned, right? Big targets. You could say that, Dobby said evenly. Right. I'm good with computers and good at creating escape routes. I can have your back while you're on the job, okay. For a moment Dobby found himself pausing, before he nodded. A surprise, but a welcome one, she might actually make his plans even easier to accomplish. That, would actually be a help. It's good you're here. Thank you. Then fire away, Dobby, Gentle said with a flourish. We're all here, after all. What exactly were you planning on having us do? I'd love to know myself, Shoto said, coolly as only Shoto could. He hasn't even shared with me. How daring. A secret plan, Dobby. He had them hooked. Good. Now he got to share. Right. The kid and I want to take Endeavor down, and all the corrupt people along the way. Compress said it before you got here, we have to take down those holding him up if we want him to stay down for good. Ooh. La Brava bounced as if she knew the answer. You want us to steal from Detnerit. They're sponsoring his agency, after all. Dobby raised a stapled eyebrow. Quote dot dot dot. If this goes well, then yes, I wanna go after Detnerit. But they're a big target, with links to people in the shadows, and I don't think we're ready for them yet. Even with a group this strong. Intriguing, Compress said, and unexpected. 
You have a different target in mind. I do. Dobby folded his arms. Endeavor causes more collateral damage than any other hero. People constantly have to rebuild after his fights and fix his mess. So we go after the people who do that for him. To steal their money. Shoto asked. It's more than that. Dobby smirked. Steal their money and they won't be able to fund his rebuilds, but they'll raise it another way. Steal their data, their files, and we can leak them all. All those NDAs for victims who got caught in the crossfire, all the damage brushed under the carpet, all there in the public eye. Compress chuckled. How dramatic. I like it. Thank you. Dobby nodded. We play it right, reveal the full extent of it, and we can send his reputation to rock bottom. A fine sentiment, Gentle nodded, raising an eyebrow. La Brava and I can certainly assist, especially with publicizing the files online. And who do you propose that we target to achieve this? Whose closet is brimming with enough skeletons for our purposes? One company has profited massively from him. They've grown like no other construction business, and because they're new on the scene, I don't think their security is up to scratch at all. They're there for the taking. Dobby looked at Compress, then Gentle, then La Brava. I wanted to ask you to join me and Shoto to take from them. To put it all in the public eye and let them know that they deserve better than their number one hero. If you're with us, then we hit Uraraka Construction Limited in a week, and take everything they have. His patchwork grin grew wide and blue fire danced in his eyes. What do you say? Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Kyoka Jiro. Aged. 14. Tuya Todoroki Dabi, and Shoto Todoroki Juhio. Aged. 24 and 14. Damn it Zhu, wait up. He ran. Heart pounding in his chest, deep gasping breaths drawn as he sprinted harder than ever, Izuku turned the corner at the end of the road and saw the final stretch to get home. He had passed the old apartment block they had called home before Incident Zero in a blast of dust and air as he pushed himself to the limit of how fast he could run, and now he saw it, their home, the one decently maintained house in the neighborhood. Come on Tenko. Tenko had been training with Izuku since they were younger, but the taller and lanky boy would never come first in any distance running or sprints. Izuku ran with nervous energy and excitement to fuel his eager personality, and his natural fitness, behind him at some distance, Tenko stumbled along like a newborn giraffe and failed miserably to keep up in any way. Slow down. I don't have the stamina points you do. There's no time. He looked up and saw his mother's car, which had just pulled onto the drive, and saw her getting out of the car. Mom. Inko Midoriya, fresh out of a long day of work, shook herself at the sight of her marauding son, and had the foresight to dash to the front door, unlock it and jump out of the way as he piled through. Izuku, honey. What is, he dove for the mat at the sight of the envelope and grabbed it up. Please, come on, after everything, Izuku, what the, Inko paused as Tenko puffed to the front door, nearly tripping over the sidewalk as he ran up the drive. Tenko what's happened? Ua. Tenko was nearly wheezing he was that out of breath. Letters, out today. If were accepted for the entrance exam, he was interrupted by Izuku thrusting a white envelope in his face. There's one for you, calm down, Izuku. Tenko snatched the envelope with a gloved hand and shook his head at the younger boy's antics. Running won't change what's in them, Izuku had disappeared in a green whirlwind at this point, slamming himself down onto the sofa in the lounge and finally coming to as he stared at the envelope in his hand. Every emotion that he could feel ran through his body at the sight of it fear he wasn't good enough to cut it, hope that after so long he would be able to achieve the dream he never thought he could after he was diagnosed quirkless, worry that one of he or Tenko may get into the exam without the other. This was what he had built up to. Ua remained the pinnacle of hero education even in a world ravaged by the Hero Commission's moves to grab power, even as private hero agencies taking on their own apprentices robbed them of the best talent. The school had become its own agency under Principal Nezu effectively, a loophole lawyers were still arguing over in the highest courts of Japan, and although its budget had been cut below its past levels, although the student intake had been sized down and they had got stricter for recruitment, only inviting 80 students to their exams a year, from which half would earn a place as one of their hero students it was still the place to be. It was still the alma mater of all might, of endeavor, of the best and strongest heroes to ever grace the streets of Japan. It was the ultimate goal. Now, after putting in applications and praying to any god that would listen, after countless sleepless nights and restless days awaiting news, the envelope was here. 
Izuku couldn't wait any longer. No matter how painful it would be if he didn't make it, he had to know. Come, Izuku. Destiny awaits. He tore the envelope with speed and reverently lifted the letter out, scanning through the contents. He wouldn't say anything until his best friend did, though. Tenko. With a rip of the envelope as he slid into a chair, Tenko stared at the letter for what seemed like an age. Quote dot dot dot. Huh. How about that? You. Izuku couldn't read his shaggy-haired friend. Are you, hey? Tenko swept a hand through his hair and smiled manically. Guess I unlocked the next level. Did you? Izuku's smile finally broke out and the tears he had been holding back burst like a dam. I made it too. Hell yeah. Tenko wasn't normally the most excitable person, or the friendliest, or the most willing to engage with anything affectionate whatsoever, but with news like this, even his emotional walls were broken enough to grab Izuku into a bear hug with his lanky arms and pull him close. We did it Zoo. All Izuku could do in the time-honored Midoriya family tradition was cry tears of joy for a good minute, soaking Tenko's black hoodie and wailing in happiness. Years and years of frustration, of other people trampling on his dreams, of the worry that he would never be able to fulfill what he had always wanted to do, had all finally been overcome by this news. Sure, he would still have to get through the Ua entrance exam, a test fabled among the youth of Japan as being a Herculean labor that changed from year to year, but this was the first step on the path towards being a hero. The first step to changing the world, like All Might did before him. As Tenko let go of the hug and charged off, shouting that he needed to speak to Setsuna and see if she got in, his mother slid onto the sofa beside him and wrapped her arm around his shoulder to give him a hug, eyes glistening with tears and a look of pride. Izuku, this is amazing. I'm gonna go to Ua, mom. He looked at her with a sniff as he wiped his own tears. Like I always said. And with Tenko too. Inko gave him a warm smile and a bump on the shoulder. You two are gonna be unstoppable. You've got that right. I I hope so. Izuku smiled at his mom. Thank you for believing in me and letting us train all the time. I, I know things were tough when I didn't have my quirk, but, but you got through it, like you always do, with the smile on your face. She ruffled his messy hair. I couldn't be prouder of you. Thank you, and hey, look. She had snatched up his letter and was poring over it. Kamui Woods sent a recommendation for you. I didn't think he'd do that after so long since that thing at the train station, I know. Izuku's fanboy came out. He's a former UA student and I didn't expect he would reach out to UA personally. I mean he must be so busy, I'd hate to interrupt, Tenko said from the doorway, as he interrupted anyway, but I've just spoke to Setsuna. And, Izuku's head whipped around as if on an elastic band, eager for the update. Tenko smirked, and waved the mobile phone as if it were a trophy. She's in too. Yay. Inko cheered, squeezing Izuku's shoulder tighter as she celebrated. All three of you get to do the exam together, that's amazing. Hell yeah. Tenko nudged Izuku with a toe as he sat there digesting the news. A full party ready to go. Ua isn't going to ready for us, Izuku. That's the spirit. Inko balled her fists and stared at her son with more proud tears. You two are going to do great. How can they not take you when they see everything you're capable of? Everything. Ah. That was the issue. He couldn't show them that. He couldn't show everything. Um. Izuku trailed off, aware how cold he suddenly felt at the thought of what could happen if he did in fact show Ua everything he was capable of. I, I don't think we can do that, mom. What do you? Inko trailed off as she realized what he meant. Oh Izu, I'm sorry, I didn't, I I know. Izuku clenched a fist, his good mood at the amazing news from Ua evaporating as he dwelled on it more. It's just. I can't show everything my quirk does, can I? Or they'll all come after me, Izuku. Tenko looked concerned too. Just because you can take a quirk, doesn't mean you can't be a hero. It's like we said about my quirk, like. Decay is something you'd expect a villain to have, but you have decay under control. Izuku interrupted, as he looked at Tenko's gloves which he had made all those years ago. To help him cover his fingertips and control decay. I, I don't think I have mine under control at all. Is this because of that Yakuza's quirk? Inko asked. Because I know you've been working hard with Setsuna to include that in your style with your Air Force quirk and I'm sure, it's not that, mom. Izuku closed his eyes and stood up, standing away from the sofa. 
he hadn't told them about his worst suspicions after that confrontation after the confrontation with the Yakuza a week before, where Hamiko and Setsuna had bailed him out and saved him and Tenko from Sharkhead and his cronies. His mother had gone straight to the police, who had swarmed the warehouse and found no sign of Sharkhead or the gang that attacked them, as if they had never existed, thankfully they had been completely left alone by anyone from the Shihasaikai since the scuffle, and it was as if the Yakuza had retreated, or forgotten they'd existed. Maybe Sharkhead had been told not to come after school kids from higher within the Hasaikai. Chance would be a fine thing. He steeled himself, not looking at his mother or his best friend. I, think I took another. Wait. Tenko frowned. When and how? We've been hanging out every day and the only bit of bullshit chaos we've dealt with was the fight with the Yakuza, show him. Freeze. Izuku turned on his heels and visualized how it had been used before, and to his absolute horror his worst outcomes became realized. The black and red lightning, so familiar as a side product to his quirk, crackled, but this time he felt it run across his cheekbones and eyebrows, rather than his arms. With a throbbing feeling as if his eyeballs had suddenly caught fire, a white flash bloomed, and Tenko was completely immobilized in front of him mid-sentence, the only thing that could move being his eyes which widened in horror. Izuku. His mother leapt out of her skin in shock at the white flash, but couldn't help but stare at what he had done. A new quirk. You can freeze, enough. He forced himself to blink and tear his eyes away, and he shuddered as he heard Tenko gasp. It was as he feared. Tenko, you remember that guy. Freeze frame. Tenko shook his head as if uncertain he was able to move it at all. When he was unconscious, I must have touched him. I don't even remember it. And now, Izuku hung his head. Now his power's mine too. I took it. And I thought I had enough of paralysis. Tenko smiled ruefully. Don't tell me you have burn or poison effects stored up in that head of yours too. I don't even know. Izuku collapsed back on the sofa in a heap, ignoring the headache that threatened to spread from using that quirk for the first time. And that's what scares me. I, just don't know the limit to my quirk, or what other surprises I have coming. First Air Force, then that steel quirk, then the way I saw Tenko's past, and now, now that guy's quirk. I just. He paused, trying not to wobble as he spoke. Steel could be hidden with Air Force as another ability I have, but what do I do about this? What do I do if my quirk suddenly gives me wings or the ability to spit fire like dad used to, Izuku? Inko looked pained at the mention of Hisashi, but her son was oblivious. Or what if it does weirder stuff than that, if it suddenly turns me invisible or lets loose explosions from nowhere? How can I hope to keep up pretending that Air Force is my only quirk when we get to Ua, if my quirk goes haywire and takes something off another student, if I do something I can't explain away? But your quirk has only done that once with that memory reading, Tenko argued, picking at a loose bit of paint on the doorframe to Inko's chagrin. Who's to say it will do that again at Ua, who's? to say it won't. Izuku couldn't shake his own negative thoughts at this point. I could end up hurting a classmate, and what would they all think if they see it? The power to take quirks. It doesn't feel right when I take the quirk of a Yakuza, better that power is in your hands and can be used for good, began Tenko, than it is to be used for evil, but do other people think this? Will other people just think I'm a monster for what I could do? Izuku's voice was nearly a whisper because of the panic that crept in. They'll think I'm a villain, Izuku, please. His panicked ramblings were shaken by the firm tone from his mother, able to cut through his fears in the blink of an eye. M mom, Izuku, I'm going to say something which I should have said as a mother years and years ago, and which I should have said when you were first diagnosed quirkless all those years ago. She rested her hand on his knee to calm him, and looked up at him with eyes which, surprisingly, held no tears. What makes a hero isn't their quirk, Izuku. It's their heart. Back then, all I could say was sorry because of all the people who said you couldn't be a hero. When really you always had it in you to be a hero to so many people. Inko squeezed her hand. You're my son, and you have the biggest heart of anyone I know. You'd run headfirst into danger against the odds and against the advice of anyone if you thought there was even half a chance that you could do good, that you could help someone, that you could save a life. If you don't see that, then I'll remind you every day I can because I should have been telling you this for all those years even before you got that gift of a quirk. Izuku, we are going to see you have a gift and a heart of gold, and that you can become the sort of hero we all need at the moment. 
And who knows if something happens with your quirk, by accident or otherwise, that means people see just how powerful it can be. If they know you, if they see you like we do. She lifted her hand and poked him in the chest, and he felt a weight lift off his shoulders. Then they will see how hard you want to work to help people, and they'll feel safe to trust you no matter what happens. He had no words that could properly convey the emotions he was feeling, so he settled for tears and wailing into a hug with his mother, glad more than ever she was there to pick him up at his lowest. T thank you, we both feel it, Izuku, she said, rubbing his back. Tenko does too, and we aren't alone. Setsuna, Hamiko, heck, even Kamui Woods who gave you a reference for Ua, your mom said heck, Izuku, Tenko said, good humor in his sarcasm. If she's this riled up you can trust she means everything she's saying. And I agree with her on everything. You're the reason I'm actually willing to train up in a hero class, after all. I'm lucky to H of you both, he sniffed, through a snotty nose and tears caused by how overwhelmed he got at the words he had been craving from his mother for years. T thank you, say, I think it's time, don't you? Huh. Izuku looked up at Tenko as he asked that of his mother. Wah, it's time. You know where it is, Inko agreed warmly. What's going, I know something that will cheer you up. Tenko started abruptly and Izuku barely caught a little look between him and Inko. Stay there, Izu. Izuku looked questioningly at his mother as Tenko stepped out of the doorframe to the lounge and disappeared at speed, but was only met by a very blank look from Inko. He knew exactly the sort of look it was from growing up with her, the look of knowing exactly what was going on and doing a terrible job of being clueless about it he called it the, who, me, look. M mom, what's, I'm sure Tenko will. Explain, dear, she replied, with what Izuku could only describe as one of the worst poker faces he'd ever seen. What were they planning? The question was answered almost immediately as Tenko reappeared in the doorway holding a white box, wrapped with a ribbon of all things. Yeah don't ask about wrapping it. I don't do paper and that shit. What is this? Tenko fidgeted awkwardly as he set it down in front of Izuku. So my quirk breaks a lot of stuff. I figured if you got accepted to Ua I would actually make something, and got a present. He jerked a thumb at Inko. Okay, so your mom made about 80% of it, but, give yourself more credit, Inko said with a chuckle, shaking her head. You did a lot, Tenko. Izuku was a little lost. BB but I didn't get you anything, you don't have to genius. You gave me a proper roof over my head for the last year or so and gave me a best friend. Tenko's smile, when it wasn't sarcastic or a manic grin, was nervous and faint. This is my way of celebrating with you and saying thanks. Gotta make sure you're well geared for the levels ahead. Whatever Izuku had been expecting, it had not been what he pulled out of the box and held up in front of him. Oh my. They had made him a costume. A homemade hero costume ready to take to Ua. His eyes were drawn to the jumpsuit, completely black from head to toe but for the lines running up and down the side of it, and over the sides of his arms and legs. Here the thick white lines were surrounded on each side by what appeared to be red lightning, a dark red fabric woven in as if his arms and legs were already wreathed in the lightning generated by his quirk. To top it all off, they had included a brand new pair of his signature red boots, with a black lightning bolt on the instep and on the outside of the boot. Oh my goodness. Izuku was blown away. When did you, last week, remember the test I pretended to revise for? Tenko smirked. You're too trusting. Do you like the colors? Inko asked, almost a little nervous. I was going to make it green but, but then we both thought black and red for your quirk would be pretty damn cool, Tenko finished. Do you like it? I love it. He did the only thing that he could, which was grab both of them and pull them in for a tighter hug, somehow keeping his composure enough to not cry at their kindness. Thank you so much, both of you. Now you're gonna look the part as a hero too, Izuku. Tenko raised his eyebrows. Ua won't be ready for you. Can I try it on? Oh definitely. Inko cried, clapping. Let me grab my camera and then we can take pictures for Setsuna with it on. My baby's going to look like such an amazing hero. Go now, before your mom breaks, Tenko snarked, almost pushing him towards the door. Then we can talk about getting to this exam. All right, on it. As Izuku left the lounge and approached the stairs, he passed by the full-length mirror which Inko kept in the hall, before doubling back at the sight of him holding his costume in his hands. For a brief moment he paused, and held the costume against himself, 
marveling at how clean and professional the lines were and how genuinely cool it looked with the red lightning. He was lucky to have his mother and Tenko. Now he was ready. Now he was due to go to Ua within a week, to go to the entrance exam and announce to Ua like All Might that he was here. Now he had people backing him up and no matter what worries he had about his quirk, he felt safe that those same people would look after him and trust in his desire to do the best he could as a hero. And now, with Ua within touching distance, he had a hero costume that made him look ready to save people at a moment's notice, and beat even the toughest villains. He couldn't wait to get started. Ready to take on the world, Izuku. Oh yes he was. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. I'm whom? Hamiko Toga, swinging her way through the door without a care in the world, sang out as she shut the door behind her and let her hair down from its buns. She had been far too stealthy for far too long as they had sent her out to do the little errand run, and now she didn't feel she should be quiet any longer. It had been enough of a pain in the backside to restrain herself until this point. Mr. Staney and Big Bro Shuichi had been out scouting on another lead they had, about some big shot hero in Tokyo using their position to scout out money for commercials and neglect their hero duties in favor of chasing sponsorship. Apparently people hadn't learned from how Uabami had been taken out of the game for her greed, and still wanted to make money more than they wanted to save lives, and so Spinner had driven the boss to check out the neighborhood. While they were out, she had been left to attend to business. The Yakuza wouldn't be stopped without the evidence she had been sent to gather, after all. Striding through the house they had acquired and into the lounge, she dropped the fruits of her labor onto the little wooden coffee table Spinner had acquired from a junk heap with a flourish. Ta-da! One order of Yakuza trigger from the Shihasaikai, coming right up. Stain, hunched over in casual clothes and his signature red scarf, didn't look at her as he cleaned a knife in his lap, casting his eye over the blue syringes of the awful substance flooding the streets of Japan with a cursory nod. Good. Is there warehouse nearby to us? About two streets from the station across town, in one of the warehouses to the south. I think their main hideout isn't far from there either. Hmm. Stain nodded, still not looking up as he stored the knife by the side of the chair. Then they're a good target. We'll act soon. Hey hey, what's with the atmosphere? Hamiko could be oblivious and carefree even by her own admission, but even she could tell that there was something up. Stain sounded a little terse and abrupt, and Spinner hadn't even spoken to her. What happened? Look on the table, Spinner said, finally. You see what else is there? She looked, actually taking it in, and her heart skipped a beat at the sight of an opened envelope, addressed to her. No way. Hamiko, wanna talk to us about this? She reached for the envelope, and her eyes narrowed as she realized that it was empty. Where is it? I opened it. I had to check. Why are you opening my mail? Because you shouldn't have any mail coming here at all. Spinner hissed, waving a piece of paper that was clearly the letter from her envelope. That's why I opened it, because the only shit we should be getting here should be the bills. And then I looked at who it came from and, she snatched it from his grasp she was used to having far superior reflexes to the older boy and ignoring his squawk of indignation, her eyes poured over the letter, the distinctive logo in the header at the top for the organization known across Japan and the world. She hadn't expected it at all, knowing full well that one of her reckless whims and impulsive thoughts based on what Izuku has said to her had taken hold when she wrote to them, and she wasn't ready for what she had in front of her. They had accepted her. Her, of all people. She could actually do it. She could make him proud. Explain. Hamiko shivered as reality hit her, and she remembered the two others in the room with her. She had never heard the tone coming from Mr. Staney, a voice so flat and so emotionless and yet so threatening at the same time. It was as if the tranquility and level tone was only the surface of a dormant volcano, under which a whole horde of feelings were brewing up to explode like lava. It was scary. Um, yeah. I guess I need to, aha. Uh -huh. Hamiko. Spinner was shaking. Please tell me this is some kind of joke, it's and not. She gulped, and tried to smile at them as if to say there was no threat. Quote dot dot dot. It's a letter from Ua. They, they invited me to their entrance exam next week. Spinner slumped on the sofa. Where the hell did this come from? It's because of the boy, isn't it? That Midoriya boy you appear to have grown attached to. Despite everything she bounced on her heels at Stain's question. Yeah, Izuku kinda inspired this one, did I miss something? Spinner threw his hands up in the air. 
I know you like the guy and I know he does good notes on heroes, but now you've applied to Ua to go with him. Did I miss the part where you hate heroes? You didn't. She looked straight at Stain as she struggled to find the words. But yeah, Izuku made me feel like this, you know. He kinda inspired this whole thing to apply there. I thought, maybe he's onto something. Stain looked at her, his deep eyes meeting her bright yellow gaze, and for a long couple of seconds which felt like an eternity she felt lost under his scrutiny, a stare that stripped her to the bone and yet gave nothing away as to how she was feeling. You are unfailingly honest, Himiko. Quote dot dot dot. Is that a good thing? Stain chuckled, humorlessly. I am impressed to a degree. I can tell you haven't tried to create an elaborate lie about all of this. I owe you guys the truth, don't I I didn't expect to do this, but then why didn't you say something before all this? Spinner cried, interrupting her. Why did you apply on your own without saying a damn thing? Why didn't we know anything until we found it now, because I was afraid of this. Stain's eyebrows rose at her outburst and the emotion in it. Afraid of what, Himiko? She took a deep breath and steadied herself. No matter how afraid of saying it she was, she had to say it now. Do you, you both remember that day I was with Izuku and the other guys when the Yakuza attacked them? I remember. Stain folded his arms in the chair. I still remain curious as to why the boy has made enemies in the Shihasaikai. It's because he's good and he stands up to people like that without hesitation, no matter how afraid. I've seen him, sir, I've seen what he's like. He might be the first person who I've met who could actually be a true hero. But it's more than that, isn't it? Stain leaned forward, the tired old armchair creaking. It's clear you like him, it's not just that. Himiko had dropped the smile and bowed her head to the floor, so she couldn't meet Stain's eyes or look at big bro Shuichi. Yeah I like the guy, he's cute, he's fun, but I wouldn't do this because of that. Then what? Spinner sounded lost. What could he possibly do to get you, a girl who hates heroes and lives with the hero killer, to want to go to Ua, he told me I could be one. Himiko shouted that, blurting it out to try to avoid the blush that crept to her cheeks as she yelled it, and after a long second of shaking she finally got herself under control. He, he was in trouble. The Yakuza wanted to hurt him and his friend and so. I tried to stop them. I stood up to them. You, saved them. Spinner asked, chewing each word with uncertainty. Quote dot dot dot. Yeah. And after I did, it didn't matter to him that I'd had the knife you gave me on me, or that one asshole tried to use trigger to attack me. He, told me I'd saved him. He told me I'd be a good hero if I was that brave. Himiko looked up now, and tried not to flinch at the interest on Mr. Staney's face. He's, the first person who's ever said that to me. He doesn't know anything about my quirk, or what we do, and yet he thinks I'd be good enough to make it. He knows I don't like the heroes. And yet, and yet, he said maybe if I don't like them, I should show them what they should be. Himiko smiled faintly as she remembered the look on his face as she said it. So I thought I could try. Spinner bowed his head and didn't look at her, and she could sense his shame, practically taste it in the air. I'm, sorry. I didn't know he'd said that to ya. Hem. Spinner turned to look at Stain after that interjection. Boss. Stain looked up, and something flashed in his eyes which Himiko hadn't seen for a long time. Hey. I think I like this boy. You're. Himiko was uncertain. You're not mad at me. I'm not angry, no. Stain picked at a corner of the armchair. You should have told me, but at the same time, I know why you didn't. You want to protect the boy. Quote dot dot dot. He's just good, you know. So it would seem. Stain seemed to come to a conclusion. Very well. This could still be to our benefit. You're gonna. Spinner tilted his head, confused. You're okay to let her go. Stain sighed, rubbed his forehead above his nose. The world has too many fake heroes. Heroes I can judge. Heroes who need to be taken care of. The mission hasn't changed, but there is merit in watching and waiting too. He turned to look at Himiko. One of my biggest fears for our mission is that it will never end. That no matter how many of the corrupt and greedy we cleanse, more will rise to take their place like weeds. If there is hope for a future of heroes who actually hold ideals of a better world, of wanting to be true and pure, then I cannot act as judge and snuff out the lives of people who may redeem us all yet. So yes, Himiko, I will let you go. Stain held up a bony finger as she opened her mouth to speak. Shikatsu High and Ua are the powerhouses of hero education. 
From what I've seen of Shikatsu's recent graduates, there is not much hope for true heroes. But we know nothing of Ua, Spinner continued, because of how secretive they have become since Endeavor threatened them. Maybe, are you thinking we have a chance to learn from them, boss? You want information. Her eyes gleamed as she scrabbled for the opening. I'll get whatever you want on Ua, get through their exam. Do everything you can to give yourself a chance at getting in and when you do get in, observe, participate, train yourself. Keep our mission secret and keep yourself out of trouble, and don't risk exposing anything while you gather information. But yes, tell me more when you're there. You think she'll get in, boss? I know she will, Spinner. We trained her, she has more than enough ability to stand on her own feet there. Stain reached for the long sword behind the chair as if it were a comfort blanket. I hope you find that Ua is the last bastion of resistance among the youth, the last hope that true heroes may be taught. If it is not, then you will pull out, and we will mobilize against all of them. Do you understand, Hamiko? I I. She swallowed, the weight of the threat not lost on her. I do. Good. Stain dragged the sword's blade along the floor with a terrible sound until he was holding it out in front of the chair, pointed in her vague direction. I want you to make me promises, though. Two of them. S sure. She cursed how she had picked up Izuku's stutter at times from hanging around with him. It betrayed her nerves. The first is simple. In time, when you feel he is open enough, bring the boy here. Tell him who you are and bring him to me. A faint smile crept across the skeletal face. He might understand our mission, but even if he does not, I want to test his convictions. To see if he really is the hope you think he is. And the second, Spinner asked, curious. The second is to not forget where you came from with us. Stain pointed the end of the blade at her now, unwavering. You have helped us find the Yakuza and that disgusting trigger factory. We will destroy it together and go after them. But, you come with me when we find heroes. And since you were the one to find intelligence on her, the one to scout out her home here in Musudafu, who brought her to our attention. He flipped the sword in the blink of an eye, so that he was holding the cold steel of the blade and offering the handle to Hamiko. You are to be the one to end Mount Lady. She's your kill, after all the work you did to bring her to our attention. She stared down at the handle of the sword offered to her, the sword she had seen stabbed through Slugger all those years ago, the sword that had severed the snakes of Uabami, the sword that had been turned on numerous other heroes in the service of Mr. Staney. Every single day of training with Big Bro Shuichi and Mr. Staney, every trick he had taught her, every spatter of blood that sent a shiver down her spine and increased her stockpile to satisfy the inner voice that craved it for her quirk. And then she heard his voice. Izuku. Maybe you could show them what they should be too. Quote dot dot dot. I can't do that. Stain let out a deep breath. Interesting. You won't make that promise. Can't and won't. If he sees something in me to be something better, then I can't be the one to do that. Hamiko was aware how much she sounded like she was pleading. You're the hero killer, I know. We go after bad people and do bad stuff sometimes, I know. But there's the line. I, haven't killed a hero yet. And if I'm going to Ua with Izuku and his friends, who want to be proper heroes. I can't kill one. Not if there's any hope of me being like them. All my life I've wanted to live and love and be me. You guys have been the best, you've let me do that. And I still believe in what we do. I still wanna do it. I just, also wanna be a little selfish and do this too. This guy really did a number on you, huh? Spinner asked aloud. Not yet. I'm working on it though, that's not what I meant. Spinner's flustered shout was interrupted by a low chuckle from the armchair. Ah, uh, boss. Well done. He smirked at Hamiko. Right answer. It was. You're right, of course. If you want to fit in with proper heroes, you cannot kill, and if I did kill, she flashed a fanged smile at him, then I wouldn't be a proper hero. And you'd have to come get me. Hey. With everything I've taught you, I wouldn't look forward to that. He looked to Spinner. Shuichi, any thoughts? This Izuku seems like the real deal if he's got Hamiko thinking like this, Spinner replied, and Hamiko stifled a laugh at how he stiffened when asked to comment by staying his reverence for the hero killer was in his bones. If that's what Ua has to offer, then she'll be in a good place. And if we have that connection, then maybe we can find people who can help bring our mission to an end. I agree. Stain tilted his head to one side as he looked her up and down. You still want to come with us when we go for the Yakuza raid, I assume. 
I can't wait. Her eyes flashed with a little of the fierce rage she felt when she saw Shark Head and his cronies freeze Izuku and Tenko. They have it coming. Good. He nodded now, and she tried not to breath a giant sigh of relief as she could see he was satisfied. Go. Go with my blessing. Go to their exams, do everything you can to get into Ua, and learn. Learn for yourself to stand up as a proper hero. Learn for me whether there is hope for the future, and learn whether this boy Izuku Midoriya is everything you think he is. And when he trusts you, when you see the real him, bring him to me. If there is any hope he may believe in our cause, then he would be valuable indeed. You got it. She smiled now, properly. Thanks, sir. I'll do you proud. I don't doubt that, Hamiko. He rose from the chair with a creak and pulled his scarf tighter around his neck, looking to Spinner now. Change of plans for this week, Spinner. We aren't going after the drug den for the Hasaikai. When it's right there. Spinner clenched a fist. Man, I was looking forward to cutting them down to size. I know. But we wait for Hamiko to settle with Ua, to get through their exams and start, and then we strike. We have others to cleanse in the meantime. Spinner grinned, and fiddled with his hoodie, scaly fingers toying with the knives that Hamiko knew were in his pockets. If you're saying what I think you're saying, I'm in. Let's go get a fake hero. I knew you understood. Stain smirked, and hefted the sword over a bony shoulder as he turned towards the door. Best of luck, Hamiko. Tell me all about the heroes when you see them. Of course. She stuck her tongue out, unseen to Stain as his back was to her. Tell me who you cut. Oh this one will bleed plenty, I assure you. The morbid joy in his voice was as palpable as the aura of bloodlust she felt come off of him all those years ago, when he saved her from Slugger. He was excited for this one. We have a giant to slay. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Izuku Midoriya and Tenko Shimura. Aged. 15 and 17. Hamiko Toga. Aged. 15. Shuichi Aguchi, Spinner, Chizom Akaguro, Hero Killer. Stain. Aged. 20 and 31. In the pale green glow of the room in the basement of the abandoned hospital, the doctor worked, and dreamed of what might be. Kyudai Garaki had relished finding the abandoned hospital in Jakku, and the opportunities it had given him to build on his work for the master. A long time ago, a failed attempt to sedate a villain with some sort of feral beast quirk had resulted in a rampage through the corridors, staff and patients dead, and the immediate closure of the hospital by a government all too willing to condemn the incident to the past. When he and Kurogiri had stepped through the double doors all those years ago and surveyed the hospital, he had tried not to leap with glee at the sight of what had been left behind. It was perfect for his future works. When Jakku had been set up, Quirks hadn't just bloomed among the population sedately, they had erupted like wildfire and coursed through the population. New conditions and new medical anomalies became a daily occurrence, and like many hospitals Jakku had been granted the chance to expand its research portfolio. A whole new array of quirk-related conditions meant genetic research was on the cards, and a hasty departure to cover up the rampage within the walls went most of it had been left behind perfectly intact. It was the perfect little den for a man of Kudai Garaki's nature, a man of his goals. He had set himself up with a little office above ground, in one corner of the hospital where he could look out over the nearby city and marvel at how oblivious they were to what sat on their doorstep, but it was below ground where he thrived. There he could tamper to his heart's content, dissect, analyze, hypothesize, and improve. To push the boundaries of known science, play God, Devil and Frankenstein in a world that would only know the dangers of what he did when it was all too late. The master had a legacy to be carried forward, after all, and it wasn't just his missing quirk. The red light flickered behind him above the doorframe to the laboratory. An irritation in the otherwise surreal calm of the basement. He enjoyed working down here, in the pale glow that came from the tanks, and one of his most recent projects hung beside him in the tank as he typed on his computer, creating a bizarrely soothing sense of companionship as he worked. The red light that went off on irregular intervals was a nuisance, and to this day he hadn't worked out what powered it, or why it seemed determined to persist. One day, he would get the damn light. There was a subtle shift in the air behind him, one that he had become used to over years of his company. He was responsible for it, after all. Kurogiri. Any news from the Yakuza? Kurogiri had long since given up questioning how the doctor knew he arrived, when most of the time nobody could detect his movements at all. He showed no surprise in his response and got straight to business. 
they appear to have closed ranks since a few of their number disappeared. I understand that the disappearance of Setsuno's quirk previously made its way to the attention of their young boss, and the inner circle, but since our intervention the rank and file appear to be keeping the whole situation quiet. Their young boss. Now the doctor was interested. He pushed his chair back slightly to spin and face Kurogiri, the glow of the room reflected in the lenses of his goggles. My understanding was that their boss was Chusokabi. Older, gray hair, tattoos. Willing to take the money and stay out of the master's way. Kurogiri bowed his misty head in acknowledgement. So I thought. It appears Chusokabi has been incapacitated. The details are not recorded in their records, which I suspect means that there is something unsightly behind the scenes. A coup. Garaki shook his head. Clearly the instability after Incident Zero bled into even the ancient organizations like the Yakuza. And here I thought after everything they had survived, we wouldn't see any changes among their ranks. Indeed. Kurogiri's terrible yellow eyes blinked. They appear to now follow the command of a new face, Kai Chisaki. They call him. Overhaul. Overhaul. Garaki tasted the name like a fine wine. Do you have any intelligence on him? Limited. A number of those loyal to the old boss appear to be scared of his power. Overhaul seems to be some kind of destructive quirk, from which he has taken him name. It appears he used it to destroy the quirkless lieutenant after he interrogated him, among others. Intriguing. Hmm. Kurogiri's head appeared to tilt as he looked at the doctor. Only he and his inner circle, the Expendables, know what the true plan is for the organization. There's discord in the lower ranks due to their lack of knowledge, but fear to speak out in case the boss turns his power on them. All I do know about his vision is what I'm told in whispers. And that is, he considers quirks to be, a disease. There was a tinge of amusement in the base of Kurogiri's voice. He appears to believe that society would be better if quirks were eradicated. Garaki frowned, and scratched his mustache. An individual with a powerful quirk and such aspirations, he's aiming to fill the void left by the master, that's for sure. And here I thought you would admire someone like him. The doctor knew that Kurogiri would have been smirking if he had a normal mouth. He claims to have been inspired by your theory, after all. Now the doctor paused. The singularity. He believes in it. Even more reason for him to act as he does. If quirks continue to grow in strength and devastating potential, generation after generation, then he believes that his actions are for the good of all. Garaki rolled his eyes, humorlessly. While simultaneously creating a world that allows the Yakuza to walk freely on the streets, knowing that no overpowered heroes can snuff them out in a blink of an eye. The cynic in me sees the additional bonuses for a group like his, in a world like that. Perhaps, Kurogiri said, fiddling with the cuff of his exquisite tailored suit. Whatever his true motivations, and whether he does it out of charisma or out of fear, he is good at inspiring loyalty in those around him. He is one we may have to watch. Keep me updated. I dare say he wouldn't like us if he found out what we did to some of his minions. Garaki looked up to see that Kurogiri wasn't paying attention to him, instead staring intently at the contents of the tank with yellow eyes that gave nothing away. Something catch your eye, Kurogiri. Hem. Black mist flickered and danced in the pale glow, cutting through the light coming from the tank. The differences between you both, are stark. Even while he was alive. Quirks are a wonderfully unpredictable thing, Garaki replied, pushing his chair back and turning to the tank. You never quite know what you're going to get. The thing in the tank could only be described as a thing. To use the word, he, was something only the doctor, with his prior knowledge of who the thing had once been, could say. Experiments and manipulation and a torrent of conditioning at the hands of the doctor had created a creature of nightmare, an abomination that defied the natural order and would make anyone who hadn't been a general for the master shiver in fear. It was appalling, beige skin as coarse as sandpaper, talons and fierce draconic wings that furled around its body while in the tank as a cocoon, and an exposed brain that seemed to pulse like a heart even as it slumbered in the tank. The doctor was proud of it. Even if it wasn't one of the strongest. Garaki shook his head, saving the designs for a gas mask to fit to the creature and shutting his computer, before standing up with the help of his cane and standing beside Kurogiri to look at the tank. He took more after his mother's side. Kurogiri shook his misty head. I would have still expected some similarities to remain, though. After all, he was your grandson, Kurogiri. Garaki chided, shaking his head with a bemused look on his face. 
Did you forget my quirk? Your quirk. For a being without a face in the normal sense of the word, Kurogiri was remarkably expressive when realization hit. Of course, longevity changes everything. May I ask how many generations? Quote dot dot dot. Huh. Garaki found himself speechless for a second, as he was completely unsure. Great, 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 great. Three, or four. No, three, definitely three. Of course, when you live to my age, it's easier just to refer to him as a grandson and be done with it. I suppose, Kurogiri pondered, if that is the generational difference between you, then it's no surprise that the quirks are so drastically different. My quirk had a bearing, at first. Garaki tapped his cane on the floor. My wife at the time, she had a wonderful set of wings for her quirk. Combined with life force, and our daughter had dragon wings and a lizard tail, and an ability to shed skin and rejuvenate herself whenever she got injured. Truly a remarkable product. And then the passage of time changed it. Time and her own relationships. It seemed the wing transformation was the dominant genetic trait of the quirk, and her children simply went back to being winged creatures, with no trace of life force to assist. Garaki tutted, displeased. If I had been capable of what we can do now, when my daughter was still alive, and her quirk would have been far more suitable and she would have been at the higher end of my scale. Instead, I have to make do with a deluded. Descendant, middle of the road. A useful foot soldier, but, a waste of potential. You weren't fond of him then? Kurogiri asked. Your, descendant. Garaki chuckled. Dear God, no. Tsubasa was a horrible little boy, the sort of child who would rat others out to their bullies in order to escape themselves. He was going nowhere when we found him. Now, at least, he may serve a purpose. His mouth is, distorted, Kurogiri observed. This one feels pain, surprisingly. Unlike the others, who went through brief agony before being neutered, he seems to still feel it. Despite all the procedures. Indeed. I have to keep him sedated regularly at the moment or he wakes and screams like nothing else. As much as I am proud of my creations, I didn't intend to make a wailing banshee. That just won't do, if I'm to present this as a weapon to a new master. Garaki waved at the computer with his cane. That's what I was trying to fix when you arrived. Oh. His lungs require more oxygen because of his flight capabilities. I am building a mask which assists him to get it, but. Garaki smiled darkly. Fortunately, it will also be able to silence him. Two birds with one stone. Ha. Very good, Kurogiri. Garaki's eyes twinkled with mirth under his goggles, as he turned his back on the tank. I probably shouldn't make the effort like that for a middle-tier creature, and I'd dispose of any other which displayed such flaws, but what can I say? He nodded to himself. He's family. The man of mist fell into stride alongside Garaki as he walked out of the laboratory and across the hall, heading towards a locked door at the end. If you're content to describe him as middle tier, then I assume the most recent experiment has been a success. Our latest acquisition. Garaki's grin grew wider under the mustache. Beyond my wildest dreams. You will remember the super regeneration quirk I acquired a little while back. The one that was incompatible with so many of the others we tried. The one that would react to the procedure and kill the creatures by trying to fix them. That's the one. Garaki paused for effect. It bonded with shock absorption. Kurogiri was normally implacable, but the surprise was obvious in his voice. You're serious. Deadly. Garaki reached the door and unlocked it with a key. Behold, Kurogiri. The fruits of our labors. As he swung the door open, Kurogiri could see inside the dimly lit room, and see the creature which sat, black knees to its black chest, in a tank of bubbling green liquid. The stark difference from the green-haired thug they had acquired from the Yakuza was all too plain to see, the bulging muscles, the exposed brain, the eyes open and staring wildly at the door but not moving an inch from its position. Everything about it was wrong, and abhorrent, but there was almost a beauty to just how much power exuded from one being. Doctor. Kurogiri's voice became smug. Now that is a higher-end creature. A cut above the rest, wouldn't you agree? The doctor smirked, before calling out. Nomu. Stand. Without hesitation, the water rippled, and enormous arms pushed down on the side of the tank to pull the creature upright. Obscene rippling muscles tightened and flexed under the black skin as it drew itself to its full height and stopped. The creature turned slightly in the tank, its horrifying beak remaining clamped shut in a grimace as it stared Kurogiri and the doctor in the face, standing to attention. Obedient in an instant, Kurogiri noted. 
he exceeds all expectations. On the contrary, he meets all of mine. This is what I have strived for since Machia. What I have dedicated my life to, to giving the master an army unparalleled. And he will be the first general. He, truly is a thing of beauty. A present fit for a ruler. For the new master. Garaki's grin grew. The finest Nomu yet. And if he doesn't accept. Garaki faltered at the unexpected question. I'm sorry. What if we miss the chance to convince the new holder of all for one to take up the mantle as it once was? Kurogiri didn't meet his gaze, staring intently at the black-skinned Nomu. With all the turmoil in the world, what if someone else finds them first? The Yakuza, the politicians, the heroes, all outnumber us, could all dedicate more resources. We may not be the only ones looking, and we may not like what we find if we aren't the first to come across the air. Quote dot 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 quote. After a moment of silence, Garaki bowed his head. You are correct, of course. We are but two men in this wide world, but we know what to look for. That said, perhaps our strategy needs to be bolder. If the Yakuza are going quiet and don't care who took the quirk of their lieutenant, then we need to be proactive. Tell me what I shall do, Kurogiri vowed, and I will act right away. Good. Then perhaps we may have a different angle. Garaki stroked his chin. The master died in Musudafu on Incident Zero, and Setsuno lost his quirk years later in Musudafu. A city where, in a previous life, I once was a doctor diagnosing the quirks of children. Was I Tsubasa then, or Ujiko? I can't quite recall. If you still have medical credentials, Kurogiri asked, then perhaps I can acquire you some records. Capital idea. Widen the search to Tokyo, since All Might appears to have followed the master to Musudafu from Tokyo, but yes. If we are able to source medical records in the city for quirk diagnosis since Incident Zero, the outliers should be easy to spot. It will be done. Kurogiri moved to stand in front of the doctor, between him and the Nomu which had now settled back down into the fetal position. Doctor, may I ask, what happens if we are still too late? Garaki interrupted with a grimace. Quote dot dot dot. Yes. Quote dot dot dot. I have given thought to this. Garaki sidestepped Kurogiri to continue gazing at the creature. Society thrived in the days of all for one and all might because of the balance it created. They were, if you like, the apex predators of heroes and villains. Society has been disrupted since Incident Zero because without its two apex predators, the whole ecosystem is filled with overpopulation and power struggles. I see, said Kurogiri. And so society needs an apex predator to fill the void, all for one is the alpha of quirks. If the new holder can see it that way, can see its rightful place at the top of the pile, then we can restore some balance and rule the roost again. If they cannot, a dark look flashed across his face. Then we level the whole system, and start again from the rubble. Calamity beckons. Gigantomachia. Realization dawned on Kurogiri. What is it he always said about the master? Why he was so loyal to him? A king must inspire fear and dread, Garaki paraphrased. Makia bowed to the master because as powerful as Makia was, the master was stronger and therefore worthy of Makia's fealty. If the successor does not inspire dread, and is not worthy, then the calamity lays waste to all. Kurogiri sounded uncertain. Shall I begin to wake him? No rush. But if Makia can be awake to meet the successor in due course, it may assist. Do you think Gigantomachia could beat the new holder of all for one? The Yakuza seem to think that the quirk is in the hands of a child. Even if the child has unlocked a tenth of the quirk's potential, they won't stand a chance against the calamity. Garaki's eyes narrowed, unseen to Kurogiri. Only one in total control of all for one could hope to beat Makia, and if they are in control of it all, then they're powerful enough to be swayed to our side. So we find them and test them, and begin to wake the giant in the meantime. Precisely. Garaki tapped the floor twice with the cane, as if it were the gavel of a judge banging for order. We find the successor and offer him our vision, offer him the Nomu as loyal soldiers. If they do not accept, then we turn the Nomu loose on all the world, and if he somehow makes it through them. Calamity, Kurogiri finished. Gigantomachia as the great leveler. Precisely. Garaki turned his gaze away from the tranquil Nomu in the tank and onto Kurogiri. You are right, time is not ours to waste. I will return to the laboratory there are more subjects to improve. And I will investigate the records, Kurogiri said with a bow. We are close, doctor. 
I can feel it. Soon the new holder of all for one will be in our hands. Safe travels, old friend. Garaki nodded, as Kurogiri's black mist violently shuddered and folded in on itself, the warper disappearing into thin air as he set out with renewed purpose on the mission. As the last trace of fog drifted away and left the doctor alone in the laboratory with the Nomu in the tank, he reached up to mop away the sweat on his brow and let out the breath he didn't know he had been holding in. The project had driven him forward, the desire to perfect his Nomu, but he hadn't taken account of the risk of not finding the successor first. They had to get it right, and had to ensure the legacy would continue. All for one would not die with the master. Master. We will not fail you again. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. In the bright lights of his office, hidden away from the rest of the world, the principal of Ua High School stared at the list in front of him on the desk, and wondered what the next step would be for the future of his school. The creature known as Nezu was used to being in the spotlight, after all, being one of the few animals in the world to possess a quirk meant that people couldn't stop talking whenever they used to see him in public. Being a three-foot-high albino chimera with traits of dog, mouse, bear and others meant a lot of staring, even if you weren't wearing a suit and welcoming their children into your school to train as the newest group of future pro-heroes. Such was the fate of a creature of his nature, doomed never to be accepted by either the animals or the humans, and fated to live an eventful life. Incident Zero had only compounded the situation. In the wake of the death of All Might, the symbol of peace who had trusted Nezu with secrets not known to the rest of the world, the Hero Commission and numerous pro-heroes had seemed to try everything within their power to take Ua for themselves. The bright future of countless youngsters had been threatened by those who feared societal collapse, and who paradoxically helped to achieve the same collapse by becoming tyrants in their own right. This was not the future he wanted for his school, or his students. And so, in the face of great uncertainty and facing something he could not stand by and justify, Nezu stood in the face of the oncoming hordes, and defied the tides of change. Since he had declared Ua to be his own agency, he had preserved the rescue training, the general education course, and the support course, key tenets of what set Ua apart from the rest of the hero academias in Japan. The public reaction had been immense in support of keeping up the traditions of Ua, and the donations had rolled in to support this vision of the future, the reaction of the commission and a number of pro-heroes had been apoplectic with rage, so much so that Nezu had to retreat from the public eye and hide from the vultures. As much money as had been donated was soon sunk into defending lawsuits and court battles by the commission trying to force a reversal, but through it all Ua stood defiant. Ua, Nezu swore, would remain as it always had a home for heroes first. The battles for its future had taken its toll on the school, as much as Nezu had tried to preserve the heart of his school. Admissions had been drastically reduced not only due to the societal uncertainty in a world without all might, but also due to public campaigns by politicians whose true affiliations Nezu couldn't quite trace no matter how hard he dug. Funding was sufficient to keep the core classes running, but while the Ua of the past would have two hero classes, and three for general education and support, Nezu was faced with one class for each, on a sprawling campus meant for so much more. Not that Nezu minded too much. Frankly the fact that the school had survived as long as it had was something he could be grateful for every day, and the fact that most of his staff had stuck with the school and their commitment to do right by the next generation made it all the more sweet. On the hardest days, he could take great comfort in the people who made it their mission to prepare the next generation, and in the success stories of the students who overcame their limits to be the best they could be. That was all it was about, after all to go beyond, plus ultra. Now he just had to come to terms with the name on the sheet in front of him, and what it might mean for the safety of everyone at his school. The application process to Ua had become tighter and tighter each year, and his school's infamy for the low pass rate of its entrance exam had translated into a stringent system being put in place. Nezu would receive blind copies of applications, with no school name, student name or birth date, and would review the remainder, his high-spec quirk allowed him to divine all the information he needed from their academics, their quirk descriptions, their references from their teachers and any pro-hero recommendations, and their answers to the set questions he had incorporated into the application. He would then make his selections of a range and allow his staff to review and make changes where necessary, before they sent out the invitations to the exam and informed him who would be coming. In theory, it was a good system. High spec was an intricate and powerful quirk, and would allow him to look beyond the obvious to get a good picture of the candidate, 
he could assess an individual's motivations, project the limitations of their abilities and quirks to see where they may fall down in the field, and weed out the problems. Combined with a blind review of their applications and Nezu considered it a fair way of treating all applicants equally, regardless where they came from. This was in theory. In reality, his teachers had affirmed the choices and notified him who would be attending the exam, and now his blood ran cold at the thoughts it provoked to see one of the names that had passed through his net. Tenko Shimura. The name dredged up memories that the Chimera had blocked in a dark corner in the back of his sharpened mind, of the world before it lost its symbol of peace. Memories of a man in goggles and a mustache, of the pain and misery inflicted on him to bring out his quirk and the constant brutal pushing to his limits when it manifested. Memories of a tyrant in a black mask ruling the underworld, watching with glee as he was experimented on. Memories of how low the symbol of peace had been brought by the tyrant, disappearing to America in a blaze of righteous fury before returning to seek vengeance and take down the villain to end all villains. And most importantly of all, as Nezu stared at the name on the paper, one more memory bubbled and made him shiver as if he'd seen a ghost. The memory of a black-haired woman with a bright smile, of her casket being lowered into the ground, of the absolute agony on the faces of All Might and Sorohiko Torino. Now, it seemed, the past was not dead. Closing his eyes, high spec whirring away as he tried not to let emotions cloud his judgment, Nezu assessed as he always did, and came up with the best solution that he could on such short notice. With a few short clicks on the keyboard a video call was launched, and was instantly connected. With a beep, the ever-exuberant present mic, a UA stalwart teacher and ever-energetic radio DJ picked up, crowing with happiness. Nezu noted that he was in his little studio he had set up to run his nightly music show, and was dressed down without his hair spiked up, without his sunglasses or any of the trinkets from his hero costume. Good evening Mr. Principal, sir. What can I do for my favorite listener on a fiend spring evening? Good evening, present Mike. Nezu smiled a smile that didn't meet his eyes. I'm going to change the schedule slightly for the entrance exam, if I may. I'd like to bring in an external examiner. An external. Mike frowned, before his eyes went wide. Wait wait, don't tell me. I can guess. Returning to Ua High for a reunion like no other, give it up for Shuta, I'm not bringing back Eraserhead, no. W-A-A-A-A-A-G-H. Mike threw his head back and groaned at the top of his lungs, nearly deafening Nezu even without his quirk. Come on man, when are we getting him back? You sent him out on a mission two years ago and we don't even hear from the guy with a text these days. You're killing me and Nem. I'm sorry Yamada, truly, but Shota knows the importance of the job and why he can't come back yet. Nezu shook his head sadly. Believe me when I say that taking Eraserhead out of teaching at Ua was not a decision I wanted to take. We all miss him. But his job is crucial. I know, I know, I'm just yanking your chain, Mike said, backing down, but Nezu didn't even need high spec to sense this wasn't true. What's the plan though sir? The way I saw it, you don't trust many people outside of our school, so if you have someone you want to bring in, you must really think the little listeners are safe around them. I assure you, they will be. I will let you know the plan when I confirm with them but there are a few students I'd like an impartial judgment on before I let them in. Okay. Mike shot him a thumbs up. I'll let Nem and Ken know we're expecting company, and we'll wait to hear from you Mr. Principal. Thank you, Yamada. Nezu allowed himself a small smile. Enjoy your show tonight. Will do. Yeah, Nezu cut the call off before present Mike's voice kicked in and broke his computer speakers, and determinedly tapped away at the keyboard to connect the next call. He had no doubt that this was what he needed, he just hoped he could get through. As he sat back in his chair and closed his eyes, he heard the click of the call connecting, and internally felt a wave of relief that he had been able to get through. Good evening. I was worried you wouldn't take my call. It's been a long time at least a few years. The recipient on the other end of the call sounded like they were doing their best to keep their tone neutral. I didn't think I would ever hear from you. Interesting. I thought the same of you. Nezu kept his eyes closed. Two of the last people left alive with the knowledge of the greatest secret known to humanity. I thought you would retreat into your agency and your investigations, and wouldn't pick up the phone to me. And I thought I told you I didn't want to talk about it. The voice wasn't raised. But the anger was palpable. I thought I told you that I wanted nothing more to do with the past. That after everything, all I want to do is take that secret to the grave. 
You did. So I wouldn't be calling you if I didn't need your help. I failed him, Nezu. The interruption was harsh and blunt. I could have done so much more, and I failed. I just want to keep to my investigations, to continue to work to stifle the threat of the Yakuza as they grow like weeds through the cracks. I'm getting closer to making a move on the Shihasaikai, I don't need to be reminded of the past. Unfortunately, the past makes you one of the only people I can talk to about this. I don't want to talk, Nezu. All Might died and there's nothing left to, Nana Shimura has a grandchild. Nezu didn't want to raise his voice he hated how squeaky he sounded when he shouted but he had to get that point across before he lost the room. The shout was met with stony silence for a long moment. Quote dot dot dot. I'm sorry, what? Nezu breathed out to calm himself. Nana Shimura. The seventh holder. She has a grandchild. Quote dot dot dot. Does Sorahiko know? Not yet. And I won't tell him yet. There's something I need your help with and it's only you can help. I wouldn't ask anyone else, I cannot. Nezu took a breath, and opened his eyes. I need you. Mirai. There was no mistaking the man on the other end of the video call, with his severe features and precise haircut and the rebellious streaks of blonde in his green hair. He was lanky, thinner than he used to be with slightly sunken cheeks, and his glasses now framed yellow eyes that looked to be more bloodshot than they ever had been, but no other pro hero waded into battle in the same white business suit, with nothing but a tie and a set of high-density seals to take on a villain with. Even after all this time, Nezu looked upon the face of one of the few people in the world to know the truth of one for all and all for one, and was glad to see him. Mirai Sasaki, Sir Night Eye, folded his arms and leaned back in his chair on the call. How? I didn't know that Nana Shimura had a family, neither did All Might. Nezu had his attention, and knew it, he didn't want to waste words. Nana Shimura gave her son Kotaro up for adoption when she feared for his safety. She feared that all for one would come for them. And so he had a child, two of them. He married a woman called now Hanada, and together they raised Hana and Tenko Shimura. And yet you only say that Nana Shimura has a grandchild. Night Eye adjusted his glasses. What happened to the family? Nezu nodded. Incident zero. Night Eye twitched ever so slightly at those two words, in a manner only someone as intelligent as Nezu would detect. Specifics, Nezu, they were never found. Nezu paused, remembering the horrifying report he had read. They weren't collateral, but police went to visit afterwards when the neighbors were concerned. All that remained in their home were ashes, and the house had been damaged beyond repair. And then, Night Eye stopped. A grandchild survived. Tenko Shimura survived, Nezu confirmed. I thought that the whole family had perished, and then he applied to my school to become a hero. After all this time, Night Eye focused. What's his quirk? Decay, Nezu said, pouring himself a tea to calm himself. He can turn whatever he touches with all five fingers to dust. Night Eye's frown twitched. Quote dot dot dot. You suspect the boy destroyed his own family. That he fled after Incident Zero because of what he had done. I, Nezu breathed out. I don't know. But I cannot rule it out, and so the feeling concerns me more than anything. How has he gone undetected until now? Night Eye asked. Where has he been living, and? What on earth were his school doing? He's been moving from house to house until recently, when a younger friend of his took him in. That same friend is another student applying to Ua, and Tenko Shimura has followed. Nezu took a sip of the tea, and relished the warmth. The school updated their records, but nothing of note came of any of it. It never got brought to my attention, or to the attention of the police, just like so many cases of the missing and the dead after Incident Zero. And now, he's been approved to attend our entrance exam. Night Eye took a moment, steepled his bony fingers, and looked Nezu in the eye across the video link. Quote dot dot dot. What do you want me to do? Nezu rubbed his snout and tried not to breathe a sigh of relief that he held Night Eye's interest still. I have my concerns. The last descendant of a holder of one for all is due to attend my entrance exam in two days. Nobody has an explanation as to why his family died in the crossfire on Incident Zero. All we know is that All for One came to Musudafu on that day, that All Might confronted him and gave his life to stop him, and that the Shimura family died, only for Tenko Shimura to resurface later. Tenko Shimura, the boy with a quirk that allows him to turn anything to dust. Nezu stirred the tea, and blinked as he looked at Night Eye. I do not know if Tenko Shimura is good, or not. 
I do not know if all for one came to Musudafu to hurt the Shimura family, or if he got to Tenko Shimura. I do not know if his family died by his hands, and if they did whether it was an accident. And I do not know if there is anything special about him by virtue of his blood relation to a holder of one for all, the quirk that seems to have disappeared from the world for good. Help me. Come to the UA entrance exam as an external assessor. Take on students for their assessment, talk to them, challenge what they do and why they want to be a hero. And among your group, I'll ask you, please, to look at Tenko Shimura. Look at him in a context where he won't suspect a thing and where we can react safely if you discover anything dangerous. Nezu took a long sip of tea. I would ask you, Mirai, please, to use your quirk on him. Naitai's shoulders seemed to shoot up, defensively, at the mention of the quirk that wasn't public knowledge to this day. I, haven't used it since Incident Zero. I do not know if I will be able to find the answers you look for, all I can ask is that you try, for all our sakes. Nezu leaned forward, careful not to fall out of the oversized chair. If he is good, and there is hope for all of us, then I want to know. If he has been hurt by the evil of all for one, and there is a chance he could hurt more in future, I want to know. I don't like asking this of you, and the morality of doing it to a child is not something I can face easily, but in a world without all might or all for one, I will do whatever it takes to keep my students safe. I hope you understand why I have to at least ask. Night I bowed his head for a second, before looking up and fixing his glasses. Quote dot dot dot. I accept. I can only apologize if my foresight is not what it once was, but I can try. And where all for one and one for all might be involved, I understand. Whatever it takes. Thank you, Mirai. Nezu allowed himself a small smile again, as he leaned forward to tap at the keys. I will send you some profiles over to have a look at, including his, and some details for the entrance exam. I am glad you decided to help, I cannot let something like this lie. I agree. Nightai steepled his fingers and closed his eyes. Thank you, Nezu. I'll help you be sure about the boy. As the connection terminated, and his email inbox pinged with a notification of documents received from a secure UA email address, Mirai Sasaki spun away from the computer screen, closed his eyes, and let out the large breath he didn't know he had been holding in. After all this time running, the past had caught up to him. Sir Nightai had regretted not using foresight on All Might since the day that the symbol of peace died. All the time he had been a sidekick, he had told himself that Toshinori Yagi was the one man off limits to the monstrous prophecies of his own quirk, that his friend and partner should not be analyzed and probed like one of the many people he had used it on without their knowledge. And then Incident Zero happened, robbing him in the world of All Might, and to this day he lamented that he could have done more. He could have seen it coming, he could have given All Might the knowledge of what happened, he could have prepared better or tried to find a way to watch All Might fight fate, the only man he knew who could have been capable of overcoming the inimitable truth of his visions. After that day he had retreated into his shell of analytics and research, vowing never to touch his quirk again. He ran, ashamed and hurt and crying out in the night from the grief, and he vowed he would never look back or look forward again. And now, only now, Nezu had dropped the gift he didn't know he needed onto his lap. A purpose, a new chapter to the story he already knew. He didn't know who Tenko Shimura was, what his story was, what had truly happened. He wouldn't know until he met him. But Nightai knew that he was a shot at redemption, one way or another. If the last Shimura was their last chance at salvaging a legacy for All Might, then he would give it his all. And if the last Shimura was touched by All for One, if he found that the villain's dreadful evil remained in this world somehow, then Nightai would not falter as he had done before. He would remove the threat once and for all, and would clean the last dreadful reminder of all for one from the face of the earth. If the boy had to die to free the world of that unspeakable villainy, then Nightai's hand would do so without hesitation. Whatever it takes, Nightai murmured to himself, turning to face the wall to his left and gaze up at the poster on the wall, adjusting his glasses as he did so. All might. I will not fail you again. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Kyudai Garaki and Kurogiri. Aged. Principal Nezu. Aged. Mirai Sasaki, Sir Nightai. Aged. 37. You know, Hitoshi, when I said I was coming to collect you from class and show you something special, I thought you might be a little more positive than usual. Hitoshi Shinso refused to look up as he stood outside the door of the auditorium with his mother, instead fixing his sullen gaze firmly on the floor. 
I'm sorry, next time I'll bow at your feet to express my gratitude. She tutted, and tried to fix his messy hair and button up his collar, deliberately ignoring his growl of protest. You could have at least made the effort to look nice for this. This is supposed to be a great day, a chance to show the board my finest achievement and a chance to show off what we've been working on for years. I would have hoped you could make the effort for me. Why? Nobody in this place ever makes an effort for me. Hitoshi jerked away from her and tried not to look at the kids from the other training class who were walking by, all too used to the murmurs and weird looks he was getting from some of them. I'm just the kid with the villain's quirk, I'm just your son. Nobody sees anything past that. She sighed, exasperated. Really? Can we not do this now? It's not the right, time. It never is, he snarked back, in a dark tone, shaking his head to allow his messy purple hair to stand up as he liked it again. You don't even, make the effort for me because you always say you're too busy. Any time I try to talk to you about it is a bad time. I don't want to be here and I don't want to do this, please, Hitoshi, we can talk after this, she said, grabbing his sleeve with a pale hand. The president is coming to see this, our best pro heroes are coming. This is the big day where we show them the way to get society back under control, you really don't see it, do you? You alienated half of society by trying to take too much control, and now you want to take more. Whatever you're planning, they won't accept you. Hitoshi. She bit, and inside he smirked at the small victory. I gave you the best chances I could, to be here and achieve your goal. And that's how you repay me. With comments like that. If you don't see the truth, that you only brought me here so I didn't get in the way of your successes, then there's no helping you. Hitoshi rubbed at the bags under his eyes with his free hand. Don't act like you care. That's not. Don't worry, I won't mess up your big speech, he replied, snatching his arm away and pushing at the door. They're all here for you anyway. They won't care about me whatever I do. Hitoshi, I, relax, he called over his shoulder as he slunk into the auditorium, ignoring the looks on the faces of the gathered bureaucrats. You won't even know I'm here. God knows he wished he wasn't there. The commission was a hellhole and he was lost in it. Anywhere but there would be better. Incident Zero had changed things for many people. Many had lost parents, siblings, children, many had found their dreams crushed and their livelihoods destroyed. Hitoshi Shinso had grown up in Saitama Prefecture relatively untouched by the effects of Incident Zero. And then, as it looked like Japan was just about to start its recovery and move on, the Hero Commission had completely overhauled the whole of Hero Society to the tune of fervent protest, Hitoshi had just been dragged along for the ride. One way or another, he blamed his mother. Haruga Shinso was a pro-heroine who had been kept relatively underground by the commission, with a quirk like hers, she had to be kept out of the limelight and allowed to do the dirty work, because it would scare anyone and everyone if the public learned the truth of her powers. She was a commission darling, and so when the announcement was made that the commission was gathering its own force of heroes, training its own future heroes in-house, she made sure that he came along with her. It wasn't enough for them to take in the likes of Hawks, Wash, Death Arms, Crust and more, in the wake of Ua refusing to bend to their whims, they had to build their own hero academy. Hitoshi didn't get a say in the matter when his mother asked him to come along and become one of their own recommended students, and his dreams of going to Ua hadn't been realized, instead, he was one of a hundred trainee students directly working at the commission's facility outside of Tokyo, learning to fight first and ask questions later in their vision of a brave new world. It wasn't what he wanted to be, and yet he couldn't talk to her about it because she just wouldn't listen. He was lost in the crowd to her, just another problem child. He barely ever saw his mother, wrapped up in her missions she couldn't talk to him about her whiling away her days in a laboratory on some project for the president. Hitoshi had just been thrown to the wolves to become one of the commission's many future investments, subjected to their harsh training regimes and made to feel as if he was part of some military boot camp. And it wasn't just bad enough that being the son of a pro-heroine bred resentment among some of his peers, the other kids would never see any merit, and would only see a boy who they felt had used the family name to get a leg up in life. No, everything was made worse because of his quirk. Again, Hitoshi blamed his mother. After all, her quirk's worst elements had fused with his father's quirk to give Hitoshi his brainwashing ability, an ability which caused all the other students in the commission's training program to whisper about him when they thought he couldn't hear. 
In the beginning, it had hurt him to hear their names for him. The villain in their midst, the B-rank, the freak. All of this because his quirk could do stuff they were scared of, because it didn't look as heroic or noble as some of those possessed by his bitter and mocking peers. Several fights later, and several tellings off from their teachers after he had brainwashed classmates into embarrassment as revenge, Hitoshi had decided to just grow a shell to deal with it all. It still hurt when he heard them, and Hitoshi was sick of it, but he had grown tired of the lack of response when he showed weakness and adopted sarcasm and apathy as a means of respite. If they didn't think he was bothered, they wouldn't bother him. He would show them, one way or another. He would succeed, however much he hated being there, and he would show them that he was more than his quirk. That he could be a good hero, whatever they said. If only to get back at his mother a little. As he slumped down into an empty chair in the auditorium on the end of a row near the front, he didn't pay attention as to who he'd sat down next to until they spoke up. I know these things are usually dull, but they've gotta be better than class, right? If it had been anyone else asking Hitoshi would have considered activating brainwashing and asking them to vacate the seat next to him, but this was someone he could actually tolerate and someone he recognized. The Hero Commission's pride and joy, the number two in all of Japan, their project for the last few years and a shining example used as a stick to beat all of their new recruits with, was sat right next to him. With wings that wide, none of Hitoshi's peers could ever hope to get out of his shadow, and Hitoshi had his own doubts as to whether he would have a hero career even a tenth as successful as the young man besides him. Even despite that, Hitoshi respected him as one of the few people who had actually spoken to him like a human in this place, and hadn't tried to force the commission's ideals down his throat at any given chance. He turned to look at the young man beside him, and while he had been starstruck the first time he had met him, now he could talk to him like any normal person. That was a rare quality within this place. You say that, but it's not your mom who's presenting it. The wing hero Hawks had wrapped his fierce red wings around him like a blanket as he sat in the chair, and he shot a small smile at Hitoshi. I did ask myself how a student got out of combat training to come and see the show here. Perks of being Sway's kid, huh? I wouldn't describe them as perks, Hitoshi muttered, sinking further into his chair at the mention of his mother's hero name. How come you're here, Hawks? No other heroes are here. Ah, no sir. Hawks asked, but when Hitoshi didn't respond to the tease he just flashed a peace sign and the wide smile he had become known for on the front page of every newspaper in Japan. Nah, the president asked me to come down. Apparently Sway's got something exciting planned that she wants me to see. Hitoshi looked behind him to the back row, to see the stern and immediately recognizable president talking to two of her close advisors with a very deliberate poker face. One of the most powerful women in Japan, rarely seen in public these days, had made it to this event. God, I feel out of place. Wanna know a secret? Huh. Hawks leaned in and raised an eyebrow at him conspiratorially, his blonde hair wafting with a blast of air conditioning as he whispered. So do I. Hitoshi tried not to smirk and looked away, rolling his eyes. Try telling that to me when you're not their favorite hero. They raised you here, didn't they? You can't feel out of place. It's true. Hawks lifted his feet up to rest his black boots on the seat back in front of him, and stared at the stage with its small podium. It's not like how it used to be. Sure, they were strict on me when they were teaching me, but the world back then was different, right? More hopeful. I believed they would let me out there and I could join All Might in making people happier. Hitoshi almost forgot that the pro beside him wouldn't have been old enough to make his debut when Incident Zero happened. All of Hawk's career had been in the shadow of a world without its symbol of peace. And now we're all just filling a gap. They're trying their best, Hawks said, looking back over at him. They just can't get it right all the time. Hitoshi didn't believe him that they were doing well at all, and opened his mouth to say so, but at that moment the lights dimmed and his mother strode through the door to walk down the steps to the stage. He hated how obvious the family resemblance was with him and his mother, even though her hair was straight and cut short. It was still the same recognizable shade of indigo unlike anyone else in the room, and he had her purple eyes, just with permanent bags underneath his. If he had any say in the matter, he'd invest in a lot of hair dye the second he left the commission's training program. When she reached the podium, with a small cough she announced her presence, and the murmurs of discussion in the room died down. 
with one last look over Hitoshi, as if imploring him to keep quiet and not ruin the moment for her, she began to speak. Thank you all for coming today. For those of you who aren't familiar with me, my name is Haruga Shinso, although you may have heard whispers about me under my hero name of Sway. I've been here with the commission for a fair few years heading up the underground heroics team, although in a world like this pretty much everything is underground these days. As a few polite laughs rang out across the auditorium, Hitoshi tried not to groan loudly and lamented not bringing earphones to drown out her awful self-serving jokes. One of his idols growing up had been the underground hero Eraserhead, the teacher at Ua who basically fought Quirkless, when he found out that his mother was also technically an underground hero, the idea had lost its luster a little. My work has to take place underground because of the nature of my quirk. It's been a closely kept secret through most of the commission, but my quirk has a number of ways you can refer to it. Suggestion, hypnotism, influence. Her gaze drifted over Hitoshi, and he made a point to look away, and even brainwashing. I prefer to call it. Trance. Of course you do, Hitoshi thought. Anything to play it down. Put simply, my quirk allows me to place an individual into a state of mind in which I am able to influence them. This can be immediately, depending on what I command the individual to do, or subconsciously, to allow for a delayed reaction from the individual at a time I desire. He yawned. He basically had her quirk after all. In the hands of a villain this quirk would be devastating. In the eyes of the public, a quirk with such drastic effects would be far too dangerous to be allowed to be wielded by a hero. What kind of hero would a person be if they could totally bypass a sense of liberty, remove a person's freedom of choice even just for a second? I'll show you, he muttered under his breath, not catching the look from Hawks besides him. Just watch me. As such my work with the commission has, until recently, been limited to underground work on missions where there is no risk of a public reveal. Besides this, I have had ample time to research the limits of my quirk and perfect its mastery, consider fully how best I am applying it. Such a power would only be deployed to be used to its full potential in the darkest of times. His mother paused, and adjusted the thick framed glasses that hung around her eyes. These are dark times. Hitoshi felt it, then. He had had a lifetime of exposure to his mother's quirk to recognize when it took effect, to pick up on the tingling on his skin like goosebumps that she was layering her voice with it when she said that phrase. Unlike him, she didn't need to get a response from her intended target for her quirk to activate, but it was a lot less successful if it didn't get a response. Next to him, Hawks stirred, but Hitoshi only had eyes for his mother at that point. Why was she trying to deploy her quirk here? And who was it on? We find ourselves surrounded by threats on every level of society. His mother looked up and Hitoshi had no doubt that she had nodded towards the president, sat tight-lipped in the back row. We struck a deal to allow some of the heroes to remain private, out of fear of backlash if we brought them all in. By doing so we have divided society, so that some of our heroes end up obstructed by those independent of us. Private heroes pick and choose where they want to enforce the law and where they want to turn a blind eye, leaving us with the cleanup duty in the end. The Yakuza are profiting more and more, and the extremist groups are shouting louder. Criminals aren't afraid of us. There it was again. As Hawks leaned forward to listen more, a frown on his face, Hitoshi felt the wave of suggestion that he knew came from her quirk. That last phrase was heavy with the feeling, the emotional and psychological equivalent of a fishing hook. His mother had a target in mind for all of this, but who? The worst of all, though, are the vigilantes. His mother paused as there were some murmurs of assent in the audience. Not from Hitoshi, who frankly couldn't be more grateful somebody was actually doing the job the commission were supposed to do, instead of sitting in their towers trying to make a political statement. The ones who think they can act with no consequence, the ones who think they can be heroes with no moral code, the ones who pretend that the law doesn't matter and that they are above us. We have allowed them to survive unchallenged for too long. Was this what it was about? All of the issues in the world, and the commission remained fixated on stamping out the competition. On punishing people trying to do the right thing, rather than commending them for helping to tackle the criminals the commission kept missing. And why could Hitoshi still feel the waves of his mother's quirk reaching out in that last statement? It's time, we decided, to take a stand. To not tolerate these vigilantes and their mindless acts of violence any longer. His mother banged the podium, unconvincingly in his mind. 
we have been letting them grow unchallenged for too long, and haven't worked decisively to rip the weeds out as they sprouted. Now, finally, we have a way to deal with them once and for all. We must wipe them out for good. The force of his mother's quirk in that last statement made the hairs on the back of his neck stand up, and he could have sworn that even Hawks beside him flinched. Who was she directing it at? So finally we have a way to tackle them, to do whatever it takes to end their activities. Madam President, I am truly grateful that you allowed me to remove the shackles and set to work, because now, we can tip the balance in our favor once and for all. We can beat the criminals for good. She raised a pale hand, and Hitoshi finally realized with horror what was going on, as her purple eyes glowed to finish the job. What are you going to do, Hawks? All the time, the wing hero had been leaning forward in his seat, and finally Hitoshi got a brief look at his face before Hawks sprang forward with a flap of those mighty red wings. What he saw confirmed every terrible thought that had run through his head, when he looked into those avian yellow eyes and saw nothing but clouded acceptance, Hawks wasn't there in that moment. The cheerful, bright-eyed youth of the number two had been overridden into blind subservience by his own mother, and from the gasps he heard in the crowd he wasn't the only one blindsided by this. Hawks landed beside his mother on stage with the lightest of touches, and she gestured to him with a proud flourish. I'm sure all of you in the room are familiar with our favorite son, Hawks. Taken in and raised by us at a young age, he's been a loyal ally as we try to deal with the changing world. But the problem with a hero like Hawks is, inhibition. All of those impulsive decisions a hero has to make when they're faced with the worst possible outcomes, all of those moments that hang in the balance and decide the fate of an ordinary citizen or the freedom of the most cruel of villains. They are what defines a hero, but in times like these, they can obstruct. Crises of conscience allowing vigilantes to get free because we fear they may have helped. Moral uncertainty because we believe the villain has a motive we can understand. These are not luxuries we can afford, these shades of gray. She waved a hand in front of his face. My quirk allows for temporary control, but over the last two years I've been given access to Hawks to work on a more regular basis. Months and months of daily exposure to my quirk has allowed me not just control for an impulsive action, but the ability to access his subconscious as I have never been able to do so before. All those self-imposed limits, all those moral hang-ups and emotional traumas. I can overcome them. Black, and white. Key phrases layered with my quirk act as a trigger to activate a separate persona built into Hawk's subconscious, of my own design. She nodded, smirked to herself. Say them, and I can bring him around into the state we desire. I can create our own weapon, a tool with no second thoughts and no aversion to doing whatever it takes to achieve our goal of a just society for all. Under this control, he is ours to command for the good of all. Behind her, two commission lackeys brought in someone who appeared to have been drugged, and Hitoshi's eyes widened at the sight of the man, dropped to his knees and allowed to remain there whimpering. This is Teruwa Hazukashi. His shame powers him up through his quirk. He lost his job after Incident Zero and decided to take that news by stripping naked and putting nearly 20 of his former colleagues in the hospital. Two of them have died, and he would have otherwise serve life in prison to this date. But if we feel that justice is not done. She turned to Hawks, stiff as a board under her command, and Hitoshi's eyes widened. Deal with him. He barely even had the chance to blink before the hero moved, and the ripple of gasps across the room followed as Hawks sprang forward with one mighty wingby, pulling a sharpened feather from the end of his wing and plunging it into the man as some kind of sword. He had seen Hawks use the feather blade technique once or twice before on television, usually to defend himself against villains with blades, but he knew the wing hero had publicly vowed in interviews to never use it as an attack on someone. Now, as Hazukashi's body crumpled to the floor, he saw the horror of it all, the looks on the faces of almost everyone else in that room were looks of approval. Months upon months of daily sessions of hypnotism and brainwashing at her hands, to override any subconscious urge to disobey, had turned a proud hero into her plaything, their plaything. They had actively sat by and encouraged her to take a man they had raised from childhood, who trusted them with every last fiber of his being, and split his personality, to turn him into their killing machine to act as they pleased. He would obey every order they gave him unquestioningly and immediately, to the detriment of anyone who stood in their way. He gave the commission their chance to act as judge, jury and executioner with no regard to his freedom of choice or to fair process. And they applauded it. Kneel and face them. His mother. 
No, Sway, she didn't deserve the title anymore, stood there beside the hero and turned him to kneel before the commission, staring straight ahead. You see what we can do. For years they have stood against us and got in our way. All we have wanted to do is police effectively and clean out the rot in our society, and they do everything in their power to sabotage us. He will not hesitate. Now we can finally begin to truly deal with the threats our society faces. Dark times call for desperate measures, but this, this is calculated and true. We can permanently neutralize the most dangerous and violent of criminals, we can triumph against the heroes who pretend to stand for justice, and we can ensure that the criminals who claim to be vigilantes are purged. That they never obstruct our judgment again. She raised one pale hand to the back of the room, pointing to the president as if with a final flourish. Finally, Madam President, we can tip the balance. We won't stop until every last vigilante is hunted down and removed from our crumbling society, and until the villains fear us once again. This is now our fight to win. Sway smirked, and Hitoshi found it alarming how awful her smile looked on her face. For the good of all. What left him sat rigid in his chair and utterly broken by the whole thing wasn't the proud smile on her face in that moment, searching him out in the crowd for his adulation. It wasn't the speed at which the president rose from her chair to begin clapping, or how immediately the rest of the bureaucrats joined her in a rousing wall of approval, lapping up how the liberty and morality of one of their own had been so brutally stripped away as if it were necessary in this new world. No, what left Hitoshi Shinso broken was Hawks. All the while that Sway had been speaking, Hitoshi had watched the face of the number two, how glazed his eyes were, how obvious it was that her trance quirk had taken complete control of him. But as the president rose to her feet to clap, and his blood dripped from the tip of the razor-sharp feather still in his grasp, that look had flickered if only for a second, and he had seen the look in his eyes change. The emotions that had passed in those yellow eyes in a brief moment, the horror, the fear, the disgust, and the absolute sense of helplessness at not being able to break free. Hawks was still in there in some way as they used him. They were breaking him for their own gain. Hitoshi Shinso stared at the stage, at the wing hero, at Sway, and made up his mind. This was over every moral line he was aware of. Good vigilantes who tried to do their best to help would be murdered if. The commission carried on. A good hero was being turned into a brutal predator to eliminate as they pleased, entirely against his wishes. People needed to know that this was how far the commission had fallen, that this is what they were willing to do to one of their own, that the commission would come for them and wouldn't stop until they used hawks to wipe them from the face of the earth. He had to warn people. He wouldn't be part of this. If he wanted to be a hero, he would have to do it himself. Barely a few hours after fleeing from the commission compound, Hitoshi found himself cursing his complete lack of a plan and how he had ended up lost in the middle of Japan's largest city. In his head, the plan had been simple. Make an excuse to dip out of the meeting and head back to his room in the commission HQ to gather his belongings. Use the fact that his mother and her cronies were distracted with their new project, and the fact that the teachers in the commission's training classes thought he was with her, and get out of the compound on the outskirts of Tokyo, sneaking through the hole in the fence that the other recruits used to head out to watch movies and go to bars. Head into the center of the city and disappear into the back alleys and the shadows, and from there once he had disappeared, find a way to warn people what they were planning. All of this sounded very simple in his own head before he arrived in Tokyo, and became completely overwhelmed by the sheer amount of traffic and people, the scale of the buildings. Every time he had been into the city, he had been with other commission students who knew the area or with his mother, who had arranged for someone to drive them around. On his own, and faced with his own paranoia that sooner or later his mother would send someone after him, he was struggling. Finally though, he had found a lead of sorts, as he stuck to the shadows of a dark alleyway in the Naruhata district and waited for a police car to crawl on by. The area had been infamous in the past as the haunt of the Naruhata vigilantes, a group shrouded in notoriety whose rates after Incident Zero had been somewhat varied. Popstep was a name of the past, and the crawlers seemed to pop up here, there and everywhere across the country, but the one name which seemed to remain present in the Naruhata area was Knuckle Duster, a quirkless vigilante with a violent streak and a reputation among the commission as someone they wanted to deal with sooner rather than later. Probably because he was so good at actually being a hero, compared to so many of their kind, Hitoshi thought to himself. Hitoshi had heard the name mentioned by one of his mother's bureaucrat colleagues before that horrible meeting. 
As such he had no doubt that if the project with Hawks was really going to be their way of going after the vigilantes, then Knuckleduster would be high on their list of targets, up there with the hero killer and gentle. If he wanted to warn someone of what was coming, he would be a good start, and if he could convince someone like Knuckleduster to take him in, he would have good protection against anyone who came after him. Hitoshi had a plan, and a good guess on where to start looking. As the police car turned the corner, he slinked across the road to the alleyway on the other side, trying not to grimace at the smell of trash and someone's piss against a wall. There was a sign down here sticking out from the wall, above the door of a seedy back alley bar, exactly the sort he wouldn't want to go into on any other day. But Knuckle Duster had a reputation for being a brawler, and for frequenting fight clubs to take on challengers, judging from the ripped posters on the alley walls giving the details for one or two streets. Down, this bar looked to Hitoshi like the right sort of place that people would go to sign up. Either he would sign up, or he would find someone who knew how to get him to a vigilante. He tried not to roll his eyes as he pushed the door open and heard the jingle of a bell above the door, and tried not to meet the gaze of a trio of shaved head thugs who barged his shoulders on their way out, instead walking straight up to the bar. It took more of his willpower than he expected to not cough at the stench of cigarettes, or spilled booze, and instead he just slid himself into a stool, noting that there was only one other person besides him and the bartender, shrouded in shadow in the corner of the bar. The bartender, a hulking man with massive biceps and a third eye in the middle of his forehead, looked him up and down. Don't you think you're a little young to be in here, kid? Funny, Hitoshi said, forgetting to rein in the snark he was so used to deploying, this didn't look like the sort of place you'd care about ID. For a moment the silence hung in the air, before the bartender snorted. Huh, kids got balls at least. What do you want? I don't want a drink, Hitoshi replied, looking up and struggling for a moment to pick two eyes to meet the gaze of. I'm, kinda lost. Most people go to the police if they're lost, son, the barman said, pouring himself a glass of something unrecognizable in amber. Unless or not being truthful with me. Thing is, Hitoshi paused, as he evaluated how much he could say. I'm looking for a vigilante. This was met with a stony look. And what makes ya think ya could find one in here? Hitoshi waved back at the door. Underground fight club banners outside in a district where Knuckleduster runs around. Either you've seen him and others around, or some of your regulars could point me to one. The bartender took a swig of the liquid, eyes not moving from Hitoshi. Certain types of folks come in my bar and start asking about vigilantes. Not many are kids. He put one beefy fist down on the bar besides Hitoshi's hand, who tried not to flinch. In my experience, a kid like that is either very naive to be asking those sorts of questions, or the kid ain't what he seems. Hitoshi knew he was being tested, and he couldn't back down. Not with what he knew or what he needed to do. Instead, he moved his hand away from the large fist and wiped it on his trousers, to get the sticky spilled alcohol off of it. I'm not naive, sir. I need to find one of them, as soon as possible. Knuckle duster, gentle, stain, any one of them, or seriously coming into my bar and asking about the hero killer. The bartender sounded incredulous. Ya must think I'm stupid, kid. What are ya? It's been a long day. Trust me, I know what I'm asking. Attitude won't get you nowhere, now come on, Anamura, a loud voice rang out from the shadows on the other side of the bar, and Hitoshi remembered suddenly that they had company. You're not harassing my new recruit, are you? Hitoshi didn't turn yet to see who was calling, the reaction of Anamura behind the bar to freeze and stiffen up was far more interesting. Ah shit, he's one of her kids. I didn't know, no no, forgive me. The voice was raspy and drawling well-spoken but with something in it that sounded almost a little sleazy. I should have told you I changed the code phrase. From now on, if anyone comes in and tells you, it's been a long day, just assume they're with me. Hitoshi hadn't yet looked left to see the individual in question, but whoever it was had saved him from a potential confrontation with the three-eyed Inamura. Whoever it was could have been very dangerous but for now, he had to play along with the save and trust that brainwashing could. Get him out of any sticky situation in the near future. Sorry about that. Should have led with it to avoid the confusion, huh? You're new on the job. Everyone makes that mistake at some point. The man in the corners had got up now, walking across the bar, Hitoshi could tell from his footsteps that he was wearing smart and expensive shoes. You mind leaving us to talk business, Anamura? 
Got to keep customer confidentiality, after all. With a nod, the bartender set a glass of whiskey on the side for Hitoshi, and stepped back. That one's on him, kid. Look after yourself he's a tough boss to please. As the bartender squeezed out from behind the bar and threw a, staff only, door to a back room, Hitoshi breathed a sigh of relief, feeling some of the tension release. Thanks. I didn't want to cause a fuss. Usually, you can achieve that by not wandering into a back street bar and asking for introductions to the hero killer or any old vigilante. His savior slid into a stool besides him, and Hitoshi resisted the urge to turn yet. Although, when a kid comes knocking with questions like that, well, consider me interested. Yeah, bad approach, I know. Hitoshi sagged. I just, don't know what else to do. I understand. They probably don't teach you about stuff like this as a hero commission trainee, do they? Hitoshi paused, the glass of free whiskey halfway to his mouth. How did you, well, you kinda confirmed it to me by not denying it there. The man chuckled as Hitoshi stiffened. But honestly, I see what you're wearing. You've turned it inside out, but that's a hero commission trainee jacket you've got tied around your waist. And yet, Hitoshi said, warily, you still stood up for me. Why? Easy. You're not wearing it proudly and you've come running into a bar like this, which suggests to me you're a runaway. And if someone runs away from the commission and starts asking about vigilantes, well, I'm all ears. Hitoshi didn't know what to say to begin with. You. He couldn't hide it. Yeah, I ran away. What they're planning to do to vigilantes and ordinary people isn't heroic. I wanted to warn people. So you're a kid with morals, huh? There was a clink, and with horror Hitoshi saw the man set a pistol down on the bar. At least that makes one of us. Now Hitoshi turned, and he saw the man for what he was. He was middle-aged, with tufty gray hair swept to the side in a parting above squinting pink eyes that peered at Hitoshi through tinted spectacles. He was dressed immaculately in a purple suit and a crisp white shirt with no tie, and the things that drew Hitoshi's eyes were the glimmering gold necklace he was wearing, and the expensive watch on his wrist. All in all he looked like a rogue, but one who was very well off indeed, if he was a criminal, then he was the sort of person who made a lot of money from others doing his work. Hitoshi ground his teeth a little, but didn't yet activate brainwashing, his ace in his sleeve. Only if absolutely necessary. What does that make you then? The man chuckled, flashing a smile which had a tooth missing. I'm just the guy who gets people what they want. People pay quite well for it, in this day and age. You're, a broker. Bingo. The man slapped a hand on the side of the bar. Name's Jiren, kid. Whatever people need, I get. They want information. I know people who can track and hack and get whatever you need, for a price. They want gear. I know a few people on the darker side of the internet, and know when stock goes missing from a detonate warehouse. And I, my young friend, can help you here. You, want to help. Hitoshi gestured weakly at the gun on the bar top. But, oh, that. Jiren chuckled again, picking it up into Hitoshi's horror. Pulling the trigger, Hitoshi was not expecting a little flame to pop up from the tip. Consider that my party trick for any customer I'm not happy with. Really I'm just a terrible smoker. You want a cigarette? Quote dot dot dot. No thanks. Right answer. Jiren used the pistol to light up a cigarette he had pulled from his blazer pocket. If the buyers don't kill me, this habit will. Anyway. Hitoshi tried to shake himself out of the confused state he was in. You, supply people. Black market gear. Some of it is legitimately sourced, but where's the fun in all of it being traceable? Jiren shrugged in a cloud of secondhand smoke which made Hitoshi cough. The commission tightened their fist, and now everyone wants gear to protect themselves. It's not just villains in the underworld these days a lot of the vigilantes want stock, too, and it's not like they can get it through normal means with the commission trying to get them at every turn. And now there's you, young. Hitoshi. There was no point in hiding his name. Someone would find out sooner or later. Hitoshi Shinso. Shinso. Jiren frowned. Sway. My mother. Hitoshi grimaced. Half the reason I ran. Can't say I blame you. That woman has it fierce against a lot of my contacts. Jiren turned to look at him. If you're Sway's kid, then you really don't have any connections. You've run away and you're now in the underworld, sure, but if you aren't careful you'll end up in a hole somewhere. That usually happens when someone without allies comes into this part of society and starts asking the wrong questions. 
Hitoshi smirked. But I do have allies. I have you now, don't I? Ha. Very quick. Jiren let out another puff of smoke. You have information on the commission you want to share to the right people, to anyone who will listen, Hitoshi interrupted. But I need protection. So you give them your information and in return they let you go with them. Jiren paused. I've seen worse barters. Hell, I've made worse. It's probably even enough to secure my support. But not many of the vigilantes I know will take that trade. How far are you willing to go with this? All the way, Hitoshi replied without hesitation. Why? If it's information about the commission, then I guess it's something about heroes. And if you're absolutely sure you want to spread the news, and want to fight the commission. Jiren looked at him thoughtfully. How do you feel about the hero killer? You supply stain. Now that was a name Hitoshi recognized with a shiver, and one he hadn't been expecting. Someone has too. The man gets through a lot of knives. And blood bags, apparently. Jiren shrugged. If you've got news on hero commission strategy which will change the game, and want to warn people what they're up to so they can plan a counter, I can't think of anyone better than the man they hate most. How about him? He gulped. This was the test, wasn't it? This was where he made up his mind how far he was willing to go with this, where he drew the line. Aligning himself with someone as dangerous and deadly as Stain would send him into territory from which there was very little hope of coming back unscathed, and he had more than his fair share of reservations about the idea of killing a hero. But he had to get this information out to someone who could stand against the commission, to someone who wouldn't be afraid to spread the news and to stand defiant in the face of his mother and Hawks and their nightmarish little project. Stain, could be relied on to do that. And even though he couldn't say that he would be happy with all of his mission, he had run away from the commission because of how unheroic they were being, hadn't he? Maybe there was some common ground between them, for how much he hated the commission's corruption of the idea of heroism. Maybe there was a chance this could work. Quote dot dot dot. Whatever it takes. Hitoshi steadied himself and made his decision. If you think he would be my best bet to act on this, then I'll be guided by you. Something flashed in Gurren's eyes, was that respect. You really are committed, huh, Mr. Shinso? To go to those lengths to stand against them, he'll like you. You think? Hitoshi asked, trying not to let hope creep into his tone. This was not how he imagined his life would go, but the idea of meeting Stain gave him hope. Then that's what I'd like to ask your help with, sir. Jiren is just fine, the broker snorted, stubbing his cigarette out in an ashtray on the bar. But you know I can't just give that to you for free, Hitoshi. You're my new recruit, after all. Your boss needs to know what he's getting into first. It took Hitoshi a second to realize what was being asked. You want to know too. That's what you mean when you said it was enough to secure my support, isn't it? You're not as naive as I feared, Jiren confirmed. It's my neck on the line with any introductions here, and my customer you want introducing to, so I think it's a fair trade. I'll look after you and give you somewhere to stay in the meantime, but, in return, I want to know. It was only fair, he supposed. He had been lucky enough to fall into the right bar at the right time to find this broker, with his crooked grin and skewed moral outlook on life. Any other bar in the city or any other time, and he may not have found the man who spoke up for him and stopped him being set on by an angry local. Hitoshi would be the first to point out the massive differences between his views and Gurren's a wannabe hero talking to a man who supplied weapons to criminals and hero killers alike but he would also be the first to admit that he was out of his depth and in need of an ally. He could do a lot worse than Jiren. And anyway, whatever place this man had, it probably beat sleeping in an alleyway. He was not keen on that. Fine. Hitoshi gave Jiren a dark little look. You might need another drink after I finish. Some may say, Jiren said, raising an eyebrow, that those are the best sorts of stories. Not this one. Hitoshi took a sip of the whiskey, and tried not to let the bitter sting in his throat get to him as he spoke to Jiren. Tell me, how much do you know about the wing hero, Hawks? Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Hitoshi Shinso. Aged. 15 Kago Takami, Hawks. Aged. 22. Kagero Okuda, Jiren. Aged. 43. Thank you for listening guys see you in the next part.